Welcome to DAX Machina. Join us as we explore the mysteries of this world. Cryptids, monsters, macabre tales, and horror stories abound. Could they be true? Are monsters real? Good evening, folks, Good evening. and thank you for joining us on another episode of DAX Machina. We appreciate each and every one of you guys joining us, and for all the new subscribers that we had recently, we want to welcome you to the channel and hope you enjoy what you see tonight. So we appreciate you all being here. Joining me in the studio tonight is Robbie Rip Reigns and Carrie Pocket Doc Davis. They were uh, my co-hosts with the Mo, Ho Mo Hosts. And uh, we have an awesome guest tonight. He's having some camera issues, but we will have his audio. Mr. <laughs> Mr. James Williams Darkwaters himself. He is a master storyteller, the king of cryptids himself, and we are damned happy to have him. Mr. Wo uh, Mr. Williams, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. How am I sounding? You hear me pretty clearly? Sounds What's good old? to me. All right. I want to start off by saying, Doc, I love the vampire hat that you have on. It's a phenomenal vampire hat. It's what you see vampires wearing in New Orleans on Bourbon Street. If you're on Bourbon Street and somebody got a hat like Doc on and they walk up to you, try and pull you in the alley, punch, stab, shoot, do whatever you got to do to get away from them because that's a vampire hat. <laughs> <laughs> it's Count Docula. <laughs> right. Um, I'm glad to be joining you guys, man. Thanks for having me on. Um, I'm excited to talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. You know, I mean, we can get into anything. We can go down the rabbit hole. We can go up the trees, into the clouds, wherever you want to go, brother. I'm ready to go. Well, I, I know. Uh, I know we've got a lot of directions we can run with this. Uh, we'll start out with uh, let you introduce yourself and you know describe a little bit about what you do. I know we kind of gave you a little bit of an intro, but kind of introduce yourself to our audience, and we'll just kind of go from there. Um, so James Williams, uh, I go by Dark Waters, brand name Dark Waters, but, um, I've been, hell, I've been on YouTube since 2015, November, 2015. Um, prior to that, I was on YouTube in 2013, um, doing a financial talk show. And, um, I love telling stories. I love telling true stories. Um. I developed the skill of sharing stories from many of nights hanging out, smoking cigars and drinking with people and um, developing the skills to captivate a room of people. So imagine sitting around, you know, a little private lounge with cigars and alcohol on the table and women everywhere. And this this constant conversations flowing and you need to be a part of the conversation. And so the only way you can really dominate a conversation is tr through storytelling that's the way you captivate all those people and pull the attention on you and so um i practiced storytelling then doing that so i would just tell stories about me and my friend and how we went to the strip club and how something happened or how we were driving in the car and almost had an accident and just tell the stories that happened and um when i decided to come on youtube i said well i was listening to creepy pasta narrators I was like, these guys suck. And I was like, they, they don't have no expression in their storytelling. You can tell they're reading something off a piece of paper. They've never really lived life to where they put that expression of life into their stories. And I said, I'm just going to tell stories like I told them when we were sitting around talking and drinking. And uh, it took off. Uh, and so that's what I pride myself on. I call it storytelling perfected because it's conversational storytelling. It's not reading off a piece of paper. It's like us having a conversation, I'm telling you a story, add some music, and wham, you have your story. Well, I know your formula is outstanding. Uh, you've got some of the best content that I've ever heard. I mean, you know, you you are definitely the, the, the big league when it comes to the cryptid field and storytelling in general. Uh, I just really, really appreciate your content and everything you've done because you kind of paved the way for a lot of us. Well, thank you. I mean, I thank you. That, that, I mean, thank you. It's been... I appreciate when people like honor you. You know, I've had a lot of people say the same thing. A lot of bigger narrators say, well, man, you know, I was inspired to start by listening to you. And I'm just glad that um, there's a different genre of storytellers than creepypasta narrators. Don't get me wrong. If you narrate creepypasta, great. I'm not mad at you. I think that it takes a certain skill set to do that. It takes a certain voice to do that. And it takes a certain commitment to do that. So I'm not pew pew in them or pooing on them i'm just saying it's a different thing and um and it's a different type of person 
that does what we do. So thank you, though. I appreciate it. Well, it's, it's certainly much appreciated because I've, I've, uh, I, mean, I used to work overnights when I was in law enforcement, and I would listen to a lot of podcasts on slow nights when there was nothing really going on. And uh, your your shows and and the, some of the channels like yours, what got me through some pretty boring times at work, <laughs> and I just would love listening to them. And and it, it, really, honestly, your storytelling helped shape my own writing. Wow, that's amazing! And you're a pretty phenomenal writer, bro. I've, I've uh. After our conversation, I started buying a few of the books and reading. And I was like, no, this is really, really good. I mean, it's fantastic writing. Thank you, sir. So, no, I'm, thank you, man. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the compliment. Well, it, it's, it's you know, heartfelt because I mean every word of it. I mean, so, you know, some of your stories really shook me. I mean, for example, when when I know when I when I was on your show, I brought this one up and it, it, because I, I will bring it up again because it's my favorite. Uh, the Siege of Lockett Ranch. That story is just absolutely gripping, and uh, I, you know, I, I think you, that it's you just really knocked that one out of the park. Of course, you know some of the stories you talk about, like the vampires in New Orleans and and things like that. I, I love all those stories, but the Siege of Lockett Ranch is the one that really sticks with me. I've probably listened to it a dozen times over the years. Yeah, and the thing about Siege is that it's a if you go back into the time period where I was actually producing the story. It was such a high pressure uh, environment to be in, like to be getting that information, to be vetting that. That was the first story that I said, okay, I need to vet everything I can vet. I want every signature I can get. Because when I when I when I first heard it, like the very first parts of it, and they were explaining it to me, I was like, man, this is gonna be phenomenal. And so it took, I wanna say it took about four or five months for me to actually go through the whole story. Like people who listen to it now, they're like, oh man, I heard CJ Lager Rancher, you're hearing in this one lump story. But it was like 30 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, 45 minutes, then another 30 minutes. I think it was broken down into four parts because that's how much attention was put into the detail of that story. I'm talking about going back, trying to check newspaper articles, trying to check all kind of stuff. Because back then it was, um, there was this thing going on where people were trying to give you fake stories so they can say that your stories were fake mm -hmm. and that one story was the one that created my business model of you no know, vet everything i mean vetting in a sense that for example there's three of us on this call if all three of you guys said you had an encounter together and da you were the guy telling me the encounter i would isolate you hear your portion of the encounter then i would go to doc isolate him hear what he has to say then if doc and um and other gentlemen, your name just popped off the screen, are on the screen. If they're on the phone together, I'm listening in the background to hear what's being said by the other person. So I'm just, I'm vetting it multiple ways, trying to figure out what's the truth. And then I would loop, I would wait 15, 20 days and just start calling y'all out the blue. I'll call somebody at like 8.30 in the morning. Hey, bro, what you doing? Like, man, I just woke up. Oh, man, I had your story on my mind. And I would just tell you a lie. Like, I would tell Robbie a lie that I know is a lie. I would inject it into his story and see if Robbie caught that lie. And then I would tell the same lie to Doc and inject that, that lie in and try and get these two guys to agree on a lie. And then be like, nah, man, that shit didn't happen. It didn't go that way. I'm like, okay, so everybody's on the same page. But it was how I developed my vetting system because the criteria back then was so tight when it came to Dog Man because people wanted what was true. Now, it's kind of spiraled out of control now where people can tell any story about dog man it doesn't really matter um because it's became so popular that people just want dog man encounters but back then man that was a different time period in the dog man feel like you had to verify what was being said you had to that's actually a really good i mean that's pretty much the way we do things in, in an investigation in law enforcement anyway separate the parties ask the questions see if the stories line up. So that's that's actually a really good metric on how to do it. Well, it was done. I was separated from the parties a couple of times and asked questions on my own, so I knew exactly how it's done. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But, you know, approaching any of these investigations with any type of system or, you know, much like the way law enforcement pursues an investigation is really the only way to do it. Uh, because otherwise you're, you're just 
you're it's your get anyone's guess you're tilting at windmills so to speak because you have no idea if about you know whether or not they're telling the truth you know whether the story is completely made up and unfortunately there's a lot of them out there that we just will never know no truthfully there's a whole lot that we'll never know but um for me from a storytelling perspective my thought on it is this like for example robbie we can relate to robbie as a human being as a man we can relate to everything that goes on in his life so let's say robbie saw um a seven foot tall no that's not really tall let's say he saw a 13 foot tall giant in the woods it was a giant man we can't necessarily just relate to the giant but we can relate to everything that robbie went through leading up to that and so if you notice um i focus on what brought that person to that encounter as opposed to just the encounter and when you focus on what was going on before and after the encounter that's when you find all the juicy little tidbits that really led to the encounter that the person had unfortunately um in this field most people just want to hear about a monster and so since the focus is on a monster you can plug anything in there plug in dog man bigfoot a rake you can plug in anything and just classify it as a monster well when you your primary focus is on that you don't really get a full idea of why it happened um also you don't have the criteria for how to predict how to predict them moving forward or how to compare other encounters moving in the future to figure out if there's truth to it because you're not getting any data all you're getting is a description and if you guys remember back in the day, we went through this phase with Dogman where there were the descriptions of the Dogman, right? There was like a chart with the hyena Dogman, the um, the Timberwolf looking Dogman. And that's when we were in the phase of primarily focused on the creature. And so that data was collected and then it stopped because once people knew what they looked like, it was like type one, type two, type three, type four. And I'm sitting there saying, well, okay, there's definitely these different types, but why are people encountering these things? What, what's the criteria to have a dog man encounter? Um, what's in the area that, you know, where, what's the terrain? What's the, you know, is it, is it uh, ethnic? Is it based on race? Is it based on age? Is it based on, what is it based on? And then when you really start talking to people and digging into their lives, which is another way you can find out if they're telling the truth or not, it unlocks an entire world of information. And I believe that's why the stories um, are so good is because I'm not really focused on the dog man or the Bigfoot. I'm focused on the person. So in your opinion, what do you think are the best, the, 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 the trying to speak English here, the, the best elements of good storytelling? Um, in my opinion, the best elements of good storytelling are, it would be a rich background of the person. So I, I want to know, and, and I've done it live on air with call-in radio shows. People call in, tell their encounter. And I want to know, you know, where you were born. What what was your, your childhood life like, like, you know, with your parents? What was your environment that you grew up in? The more rich detail I can find out about you, the person, um, the more I can make the person that's listening relate to you. Because that's the only, again, that's the only thing we relate to. So, for example, um, there's people who came up in single parent households. And then people who come up in single parent households, they have similar experiences, right? Um, if you grew up with your mom and your mom was working all the time, you spent a lot of time at home alone. Um, and then there are psychological aspects of your life that develop being on, being based on being a child at home alone, right? Mm -hmm. um, or, uh, let's say you grew up with a father who was a police officer. There's psychological differences in people who grew up who had parents that were law enforcement and who weren't law enforcement. Now, when you look at the audience that's listening, if you start to capture those details of that person's life, then there's a segment of the people that's listening that grew up in a single parent household. And guess what? They directly relate to that story immediately, right? And so from a story perspective, when I'm talking to a person, I want to find as many things that you can relate to as possible. So it may be you had a divorce. It may be you had trouble at the house. It may be that you grew up in a single parent household. It may be that you had a dog. It may, But each and every one of those things are buckets where people can relate to them. 
And so the more little buckets of relation that you can put out, the more people are in tune with the story and the more it affects each and every person. But it's a process of going through the eyewitness and really kind of pull it out a shovel and dig it into their life. And not every eyewitness wants you to dig into their business like that. And to me, that's the first sign that you're not telling me the truth. Like if if you want your story out there and I don't start with the monster and I start with, hey, man, tell me about your first paranormal experience. Well, like, what the hell does that have to do with dog, man? I'm just trying to figure out, you know, the, there's a pattern of this in your life. What was the neighborhood like you grew up in? You know, oh, I grew up in the country. Well, when you say country, there, you know, there's semi-rural, there's rural, there's did you grow up on a road with the only house on the road? And so I start digging and digging and digging and digging. And when it's all said and done, I have all the facts about this person, not just he saw a monster that was 12 foot tall with yellow eyes and a tail or no tail. And so that's the elements of storytelling that make it relatable to people. And that's what makes the stories what they are. I, uh, I would definitely agree with that. Uh, I've always believed that the more relatable the characters are, the more your readers are going to connect to those characters. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, that that happens by plan and sometimes it happens completely by accident. I mean, I've got characters in my books that I've designed to just be a throwaway character used for a scene or two. And people just absolutely fell in love with the character and I wound up keeping them around. And that's happened more than once. You know, it, sometimes it's lightning in the bottle and sometimes it's just hard work. I'll tell you this. Um, if I was to ever write something that was like a, a fiction novel, my characters were to, to develop characters, I would literally go and hang out with people in, in the French quarters and just have drinks with people, buy them drinks and just sit there and just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and, talk and just listen. Because at the end of the day, um, if you're in a room full of 20 people, you got like you, you have a, a plethora of information that you can pull from individuals to use for anything that you want. You know, there's if you're in a room full of, for example, I went to a birthday party, right? This was two weekends ago. I go to a birthday party, real uppity to do birthday party. I go to a birthday party, there's a radio talk show host there. I'm talking to him, what's up, bro? How you doing, man? Blah 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 blah. He's talking about politics. So we spend about 15 minutes talking about politics. Then I'm watching the room. In that room, there's a, a wife who's pissy drunk. She's got spray tan on and she's complaining about her spray tan. And her husband is aggravated because she's pissy drunk. And, and so I'm watching that, observing what's going on between them two. Then I go and interject myself in that. And I'm talking to the wife. And she's like, oh, you should hang out with my husband. But he seems like he's a little bit of a butthead. And so I'm like, okay, you're a butthead, so I know how to deal with you. So I get up in your face, and I'm talking to you. I shake your hand. I hold your hand. I make you talk to me. I say, hey, man, come on. Let's talk outside. And so he comes outside and talks, and I find out he's having a bad day. And I'm just working in the room talking to people, right? And in an environment like that, you start to see all these personality traits and how they relate to each other. So you see the husband and wife relating. You see how the, the uh, in-laws relate to that husband and wife. And you see the room divided into their cliques and all those different things. So um, it's human nature that makes stories amazing. Um, and so if you can understand the nature of human beings um, and then capture that, whether it be in a fictional sense or non-fictional sense, then you will have, I mean, a smash story. I just like to talk to people. I love talking to people. You know, I think I think that is is an absolute wonderful way to do it. I mean, as a writer, uh, you know, basically studying human behavior, uh, like you were saying at a party, you know, watching people in a crowd is like a master class in character building. You see these 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 personality traits. You see how people truly react. And one of the things I've always done is when I do my dialogue. I will I will go back over a scene that I've written that uh, of a character exchanging di characters exchanging dialogue. I will read it out loud, and if it sounds stilted when I read it out loud, it's going to read stilted. I want it to sound natural. I want to you know there's going to be there's going to be dialects. There's going to be people who pronounce words differently, and I try to capture that as much as I can. And I I, I think uh, listening to your stories is a master class in that because you are so good at capturing the characters of people. 
No, that's what I try to do. And I'll give you an example. It's like when we first came on, turns out Doc and I have family from Mississippi, right? We ran through Hattiesburg, Laurel, Lumberton, Poplarville, all these places. I mean, that was instant, right? Mm -hmm. And so I know there's certain things that he can relate to that I can relate to immediately because we've been in those same areas. We can relate to that red dirt. We can relate to the smell that it smells like outside. We sometimes smell like damn chitlins for no damn reason in the air, but I don't know why it's that way, but you smell it. Um, you can relate to the boredom. <laughs> you see, Doc knows what I'm talking about. You can relate to yeah. the boredom of being in that area where there's absolutely nothing to do. You can relate to being in a town where the best place to go out to eat is like uh, 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 Carl's Jr.'s or something like that, and they have a nasty hot dog with chili on it. You can relate to all those things. The gas station serving food. I mean, and, and it's those things that somebody who grew up in small town Mississippi absolutely know to be true you know um and so that's the essence of storytelling is capturing those things like i remember when i was a kid um when my grandfather died in lumberton the the uh graveyard with that is at the the bottom of this hill so you had like right up a hill ride for about a half a mile and then you go down this hill into the woods and a graveyard is down this hill into the woods and when everybody's out there for a funeral, it's cool. But when you just go to that graveyard by yourself in the broad daylight, man, it's really spooky. I mean, because it's you're down in this valley and it's a graveyard surrounded by wood and you start hearing stuff. You're like, what the hell is going on out here? And it's coming from the woods and it's it's ridiculous. I only went there twice. So we'll never go there again. Um, and there's graveyards like that all through Mississippi. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So... Um. <laughs> Got a super chat from from Marty from Nona Boss. Wanted to say thank you for that. And Josh Dalton just gave us a super chat. And he said, DA asked Dark Waters about the alpha readers you use as your sounding board. I have a system of what I call my alpha readers. And as I'm writing, I will send them like I'll send them an entire chapter and to get their get their opinion on it. And I also use them as a, as an idea for sounding boards for stories. Do you do anything like that? No. So my creation process is this. You'll tell me a story. I'll sit here and listen. We'll go through the process of me asking you questions. So um, we'll do that for, in some cases, two days. Other cases, it's a week. Other cases, it's a month. And then I will turn on the microphone, and I will just start telling the story based on everything I remember. Um, and so if you heard the, the audio file of it, it's really dirty because you'll hear me saying stuff like, uh, and um, and and then eventually I get the stride because I see everything that the person said in my head. So, for example, if we're talking about me and Doc, a Doc story, a Doc gave me a story about Mississippi, I would say, I remember growing up in Mississippi, and then I would give them the, the time range, you know, the, the, if it was in the 80s, it was in the 90s. And then from there, I'll go into the description of growing up, going outside in the middle of the, going outside in the morning, it smelled like chitlins and uh, red dirt on my shoes. And I would just keep on talking through it until it starts to form together. And so I'll go through all the details and form them together. And then once a, those details are out of my mouth, then I'll go into what the encounter was. I may have to jump forward 20 years of that person's life to get to that encounter. But during that conversation with Doc, he may have told me something else that happened uh, when he was, let's say, 22 years old. He went to college and got his heart broken. Or, and I'll jump to that. And then I'll jump to what happened around the encounter. And I'll send it to an editor. My editor knows, okay, well, when James is recording, these are certain things to look out for. So he'll look out for my command words like, wait, listen, pay attention. And so he knows when he hears that, he says, okay, this is a part that he's emphasizing in the story. And he edits the mistakes and then bam, you get a story. And it's just like that. Well, I think that's a great process. I mean, you know, every writer, if you talk to a dozen writers, you're going to have a dozen different ways of things being done. Uh, but, you know, what, one thing I've always done, I grew up on a farm. I grew up reading everything I could get my hands on. And every book I've ever read was research for to develop my own writing style. And I think that every book, even if it's a subject we don't really care about, every book has something to teach us about how stories are put together. And uh, I've, I've been pretty fortunate to, to, to study at the hands of a lot of people that uh, were just absolute wonderful storytellers. And uh, every one of them helped, helped guide, guide my hand when it comes to my own writing. 
I'm gonna tell you, bro. When I was a kid, I was in a slow reading class. So me, <laughs> me reading wasn't the best thing. I remember it was uh, Saint Leo the Great, bro. <laughs> this is hilarious. It was Martin Luther King Day, and you know what? In New Orleans, it's Martin Luther King Day. You got to get up there and you got to read the Martin Luther King speech. I have a dream, and she's like, "I want you to read this." And I was like, "I'm not really a good reader," and I was like, "I have a dream to 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 today." <laughs> and the lady's like, "Son, what is wrong with you?" And it turned out that I was a nervous reader. It wasn't that I couldn't read, but I got put in this little slow reading class when I was younger. So I was sitting there with kids who was like full on retards. <laughs> and so I never really had a propensity for sitting down reading. Um, it's always been, um, I've been a talker and been had the ability to talk to people. So I just, I perfected that. Um, and I, I just perfected my strength as opposed to really worrying about my weakness. And I think it translates when I do um, try and do anything in writing. So like my books that I'm producing now, guess what? Those books are me telling the story, like I'm telling a story right now. And then I have uh, AI transcribe that audio into words. And then that goes into a book. And that's just how I do it. Because if I sit there and try it. and write it, it's going to be crazy. It's going to be like, what the hell is this? It's like a gorilla wrote this. I've had nights like that. If I get tired, I, I when I, I can tell when I'm getting tired because I'll start repeating paragraphs. Uh, you know, I'll be typing along. I'm like, wait a minute, didn't I just say that like a page ago? And I'll go back and look. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> time to stop for the night. <laughs> but that's that's my process, bro. Um, and I, I, at some point in time, I'm trying to set this studio up in here now. I'm going to start doing. Where I just go live with a microphone where I'm standing in front of it and mm -hmm. I'm just going to tell the story with the music playing and everything um, and just tell them boom, 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 um, and just fire them off live. You know, I had, I was working a deal where I could work with a part of one of New Orleans's uh, orchestras. It was really a ghetto orchestra. It was more like a second line band, but they called themselves an orchestra where um, it was just going to be on stage with me telling stories, with them playing the music. Um, we had two practice sessions, and then one of the guys got shot. And that was the end of that. He got shot in the leg and lost his leg. That was crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, two, two, three, and knock a whole leg off. <laughs> It'll do some damage, bro. Yeah. I've, uh, I've, I've seen seen plenty of that in my in my my career firsthand, so... Yeah, I've seen plenty of times what gunshot can do to somebody. It is, it is not pretty. Yeah, bro, it's horrific, man. It's horrific, and that that put an end to that. But that's um, for me, that would be the epitome of storytelling. Would be okay. Turn on a microphone, turn on a camera, have people playing live music, and just boom, go. Period. Mm -hmm. And there's just go because there's very few people who can do that. Um. And I know I can do it. It may take me a little while to, you know, do the story and then practice saying it because I don't have the advantage of an editor correcting mistakes. But um, that's where I'm headed towards. And that's what I want to do. And I think that's a great way to go with it. I mean, you know, let's use music as an example. Uh, I'm, I'm a big fan of all kinds of music. Uh, but if I had the choice of listening to a band performing live over listening to a record, I'm going to pick live because there's just something, you know, something electric about a live performance. And I think that, you know, that uh, storytelling is going to be the same way. There's a, there's, there's a, there's a big difference between listening to an audio book or, you know, uh, reading a book for yourself and sitting around a campfire, hearing somebody tell you a story because you get those little nuances, those, those you know, it's, it's a more living form of storytelling. And I think that's going to be awesome when you do that. Yeah, I think it's going to be really, really cool. Um, and, you know, that's what I really love about storytelling. Like um, the Foundation Room, House of Blues, New Orleans, right? Mm -hmm. Um before the before Live Nation took it over, when you went up the, the elevator to the foundation room, you were coming to this hallway with the most beautiful tapestry on your right and your left. It was like uh, these bright red and orange colors. You would like walk down this hallway. It's about 15 feet long. You'll come into this open space, the bar to your right, to your left are seats. Uh, in front of you is this giant fireplace. But if you went to the right of the bar, 
there was a stage area. And going past that stage, you'll go make a left past the stage and go into this room that was called the prayer room. Well, the prayer room had a giant Buddha statue in it. And it was a private room. So the foundation room is a members only club. And so we would book that room. Um, typically, it would be a Friday night or Thursday or Friday night. And you would have every bit 15, 20 people in this space hanging out and just talking. And we're talking about people from all walks of life, bankers, um, chicks that were exotic dancers, chicks that were teachers, guys that were real estate agents, guys that were drug dealers. It would be this big mesh of people hanging out. And when you find yourself in an environment like that, some of the most richest stories you will ever hear come out. Like bankers talking about wrecking yachts um, in Ibiza. Like, yeah, I remember I wrecked my yacht. And I'm like, well, you wrecked what? Yeah, I wrecked my yacht. And his friend's like, yeah, the son of a bitch wrecked the yacht and we ran into a rock. And I mean, some of the most beautiful, I mean, vivid descriptions of stories come from those type of environments. Girls talking about guys stalking them at work and following them down Bourbon Street when they get off at four o'clock in the morning and macing them. And that's what I, I would like to capture in my stories. Those like really, really vivid imageries of what happened in people's lives. Um, because that's what I was used to hearing and then share my, my personal stories, which are just crazy, insane stories that, uh, that have nothing to do with the paranormal. And so, um, to me, that's the essence of storytelling. It's for like four guys sitting here sharing their lives. And that's all the story is because our lives are stories, you know, um, it just plain and simple. That's what your life is from the day you're born to the day you die. It's a story. That's why they say people's lives are written in the book of destiny in heaven. It's a story. And um, I like to capture people's stories in their lives. Well, I, I, uh, speaking of, uh, you know, impacting people's lives, uh, I want to want to take a minute to say something before I forget to say it because I wanted to do it on the air. Uh, I just wanted to let you know how much I appreciated while I was in the hospital, how often you checked on me. Um, I mean, you folks out there don't realize, you know, he is Dark Waters. You know, James is not just a face on the, on the Internet. He's a very, very awesome fellow. He's a great gentleman and he has had some lengthy conversations with me. He checked on me daily while I was in the hospital, uh, prayed with me on the, on the phone on more than one occasion. And I, I, you, you, I don't know how much that meant to me. It meant the world that, that you not only reached out to make sure I was okay, but not, and pr but prayed with me and prayed for me. And uh, I, I want to thank you really from the bottom of my heart for that. That was, it, it made a hell of a difference. It really did. No, my brother, you are more than welcome. Um, you really are. That's one of the things that I'll say this to you guys, that after being in this field for so long, I would say the first three years was really figuring out what was going on, right? Like, what's going on with this dog man crap? What's going on with this Bigfoot crap? You know, what's going on with this person, that person? You get to a point where you really realize that what we what we do is all about people and it's about how we shape people's lives with our words and our actions and that in the essence your job is to make people's lives better um you have a responsibility because you have a microphone and you've been blessed to have influence to make people's lives better and anything that you do that does not um do that you're going to be held accountable for it. And so I have a clear understanding of that. And so I choose to do everything I can to make anybody associated with me and around me to make their lives better. Um, now I'm hardcore about it. You know what I'm saying? I'm not I'm just a guy from New Orleans, so I'm going to shoot straight with you. Um, and most people can't handle certain parts of my personality. But I just, at the end of the day, man, that's what I believe. I'm here to make people's lives better. Um, and it just so happens to be cryptids and talking about monsters is what I'm doing at this phase in my life to make people's lives better. But when I go back and look over my life, at one point in time, it was real estate transactions where I was a real estate investor and helping people out of foreclosures and helping people buy houses that never had a house. 
um, helping old ladies keep their houses. And then prior to that, it was um, working in corporate America, helping people who were engineers get placed in jobs that they probably never got placed in. Um, and so that's my mission is to make people's lives better. And, and, and I think I do pretty decent at it. I'm working on developing more skills and better understanding uh, and better discipline because it's real important that you're disciplined about it. But, you know, I appreciate you uh, acknowledging that, man. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Well, thank you. You know, not, not only you know, did the conversations really help when I really needed it, uh, it you also kind of redirected my life a bit to a better focus. Uh, I, I have much more spiritual conversations with the, with, with the Lord than I ever have before in my life. Uh, it, that brush, that brush with, with uh, mortality and the conversations that I've had with you, I'm, I'm proud to say that it has certainly altered my worldview. We'll, we'll put it that way. And I, I, I feel like I'm a, a better person for it. No, nah, that's awesome, brother. And if you guys don't mind, I'll say this. So when you really look at this field as a whole, and this is pure data-driven analysis from eyewitnesses, and I've said this publicly, but when you really look at the field as a whole, and you guys will talk to eyewitnesses, and I'm pretty sure you can verify this. If you look at the state that people are in when they have encounters, whether it be dogman, Bigfoot, paranormal, demon, monster, water moccasin, whatever the hell it is, there's different states in their life that they're in. Most of those people find themselves in a place of brokenness, either they're in a hospital with a sickness, um, they're in a broken marriage, uh, they're in a broken relationship, but something is broken. And um, biblically, it's a broken and contrite heart that God does not refuse and turn away. And so these people find themselves in these broken states, and then they have these encounters with things that are attracted to that brokenness. And if they're not redirected in the right way, they end up going down the wrong path. Um, that brokenness is something that we all experience. We're men here on this on this on this show right now. I guarantee you, each and every one of us has been broken in some way, shape, or form that's so personal that we probably won't want to talk about publicly. However, it's that brokenness that makes us the strongest. And so when I see and talk to eyewitnesses and I realize that things are broken. Like one of the more recent ones I talked to, I mean, he found out his wife was cheating on him. I mean, the way he found out was horrific. And he was like, man, you know, I'm, I'm really going in a dark place mentally. I want to hurt her. I want to do this. I was like, wait, 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 homie, you tripping, man. Like you bugging out. Like, what, what do you mean you want to hurt her? He's like, nah, man, I want to do it. I was like, nah, 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 nah. Stop. This is what you need to do. So you need to pray. I said, and then you need to see if you can get your wife back. And I said, if you can't get her back, then guess what you need to do? He was like, what? I said, you need to go find somebody else that's going to love you. And he cries on the phone. He says, man, you know, I never thought I would get this kind of advice from you. I said, well, getting the advice that you need based on the situation. And um, that's why I have such great relationships with my eyewitnesses. Um, because those are the conversations that it, it, inevitably it goes to whatever that core issue is in their life. Um, because I'm digging through their life, looking for all the details to put in the story. And so um, we have a unique position and we have a unique opportunity to help broken people. And trust me, when you do it, God blesses you in ways that you will never, ever comprehend, because that's what we're supposed to be doing. Well, I, I certainly appreciate everything you've done for me. Uh, we had a super chat from Enki who had a question for you, sir. He says, you've interviewed Jeff Nadolny on his investigation of missing people. There's proof that the government is covering covering this up. Should we all be concerned? Scale of one to ten? Not concerned about cryptids, cover-ups, but all the rest of the crap they're covering up. Hell yeah, you should be concerned about that. You should be concerned about the fact that your borders is wide open, terrorists coming over, blowing up and burning up forests and blowing up power grids. Um, you should be concerned that your government is spending money, billions of dollars on foreign wars while we're going into the next Great Depression. So scale of one to 10, I take it down to a three. The other stuff that you really need to be focused on, it's, it's right there in front of you. And it's a conspiracy playing out in front of your eyes. And that's what I would say about that. Um, now, if you are a person who's, um, if your job is to work in 
you know, uh, the forestry services or a park ranger or something that requires you to be in the woods and you have no choice but to be in the woods, then yeah, you, you need to be a, a nine or a 10 because you can come up missing and nobody would really give a damn. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? They're they going to cover that up. But it just yeah. depends on what you're doing for a living. Um, unfortunately, when you consume this content um, a lot, it, it kind of takes precedent and priority over other things that you really should be focusing more on. Um, you see it all the time in the, in the field. You'll see just creators who have problems at home, problems in their relationships, because they focus on this more than they should. Um, and I've said before in many interviews that anything that you give your attention to is worship. And people don't seem to get it that, yeah, this is a field where worship is done. And so I would say this to you, sir. Focus on the things that affect your life uh, in the short term and long term and enjoy this as entertainment. Because unless you meet a certain criteria, the chances of you running into a Bigfoot or a dog man or any of those things are extremely slim. I know it seems like it's a high chance because of the stories that come out, but they happen under certain criteria and circumstances that, I mean, you, you need to at least have two of them active in your life in order to have the encounter. Now, if you're one of those guys that get hit, you check off five of the boxes. Oh yeah, that's your behind. You're going to have an encounter with something. But most people don't check all five boxes. They check all one or two. So, I know you've collected a lot of stories over the years. What's the one story that stays with you the most? The one that really affected you? Uh, it's one that I never finished telling. And it was, um, I started talking about these children that were going missing in New Orleans. Um I'll bring you guys back. So when I, I only went to Coastal Coast AM once and I've only um, decided, I haven't tried to go back because of the things that transpired afterwards. But when I was going to Coastal Coast, um, the police chief at that point in time was a pretty good friend of mine. And so I'm talking to him about the paranormal. We were at this place called Sweet Lorraine's Jazz Club, smoking cigars. And he was like, Big J, can't believe you telling freaking scary stories online. This, you know, he just like going off making fun of me. And I'm like, look, chief, like, uh, you know, I hear about the vampires in the French quarters. I've heard about the people in Harris casinos who wake up with their kidneys missing. And he's kind of looking at me like, how you know about this stuff? And I was like, why don't you tell me some of the worst stuff that happens here? He was like, man, you ain't ready for that. And I was like, yeah, why don't you tell me? He said, okay, I'm gonna put you in contact with a couple of detectives. That's when I got in contact with the detectives that were investigating things that they considered paranormal in New Orleans. Um, and one of the worst things was this group of little girls that had been going missing. It was seven girls that went missing. Um, one of the girls they found with a heart cut out and like just gone, like a heart missing. And um, I got the whole story as to what happened. And it was just, it was too much. It was too much for me. Um, it, it was just way too much. And I'll just say this. There are people that will pay a lot of money for a human heart. And it's not to be yeah. used for surgery or to replace another human's heart. And that's because of the city that we grew up, I grew up in, and the magic practice that's done in this city, that they will pay a lot of money for a human heart. And the more innocent that person is, they'll pay more money. And when you get to the underbelly belly of New Orleans, like I can tell you, honestly, I was a part of the underbelly of New Orleans. I mean, if you really look up my background, um, I was on the public private partnership for the city of New Orleans appointed by Ray Nagin. I mean, I, I'll tell you, I was in the belly of the city. I, I, I was, but then there was another belly that I wasn't a part of. And I started finding out about that one. And that one freaked me out. I mean, that one really, really freaked me all the way to hell out. So a lot of the worst stories I've never told. Like, I couldn't bring myself to tell that whole story. So I told, a, I told like, a small portion of it, maybe 15 minutes, and I just stopped. Um, 
and here's the crazy thing about those detectives. So um, after I started talking about them, they disbanded the group of detectives because I talked about it on Coast to Coast. And they started one by one retiring. Um, and when I tell you they were investigating things like hellhounds that they were seeing, they were investigating um, real voodoo rituals that were happening in New Orleans. So there's voodoo, then there's voodoo, real voodoo rituals that were going on, um, suicides that were going on that were ritual suicides. Um, this, I don't know what the hell this thing was, but this man that people were seeing in the projects that was walking through walls, that was a eight foot tall black guy that literally would walk out of the wall, the project walls, he's eight foot tall and scare the hell out of everybody in the project courtyard. Um, they were investigating those things. And then they all retired. Um, and I still have numbers on them, but when you call or talk to them, it's like, I, I don't want to talk about it. Like, I just, I just don't want to talk about it. So um, New Orleans is a place where people go to hang out, right? Oh, I'm going to go to New Orleans. I want to hang out. You know, me and my friends are going to have fun. We're going to go on Bourbon Street. We're going to get hand grenades. You know, we're going to go to the strip club and do this. And, and it's an extremely dangerous place with levels of danger that most people will never comprehend. Yeah. Um, they just won't comprehend it because they don't believe that level of evil exists, but it does. And it exists here in New Orleans and it's terrifying. Just like the vampires on Royale. Mm hmm. And like, for example, we, let's say we're talking about vampires, right? You can, if you know where to look, and I'll tell you how to look at it. If you know where to look, go look at Comus and Momus um, Mardi Gras parties, the, the parade parties. Go look at those parties. Go look at those bloodlines. Go look at those people and see how those families have been in control of things since 19 freaking 10. It's ridiculous. I mean, it, it's, it's totally and utterly ridiculous. Um, and so then you have the sanguine blood drinking vampires down there. Then you have the psychic vampires, which plenty of tourists run into, don't understand why they ran into that. And hey, man, I was just hanging out with this guy in a bar. And next thing you know, I felt drained and I woke up in, in a strange place. Like, no, nah, no, nah, you ran into a vampire. You went into a little walking coma and you woke up in a hotel and you know what happened to you. Um, but people think it's a game. You know, like they think it's a joke. And it, it really just it just isn't a joke i mean most people don't know there's new orleans has three of the top witches in the world reside in new orleans and they're in magazines as the top 20 witches in the world three of them reside in new orleans two of them are pretty cool i know them. one of them is you, you just can't talk to that person so um new orleans was where the um the head of uh, the the guy who was over the entire, I don't even know the name of the organization, but there was an organization for voodoo um, for the state of Louisiana. He was a martial arts instructor in New Orleans. Um, and I, I did an interview with one of my friends who talked about him and his other martial artists that he had beef with. The guy was living in Mississippi. And you know, Doc, you know this, in Mississippi, they burn their leaves, right? You, you, you burn trash, you burn leaves. Yeah. He goes out into the backyard to burn yeah. his leaves yeah. and his trash, sets it on fire, steps back, and then, excuse me, a east wind comes, very significant the word I'm using, the east wind comes, and it blows, and the leaves form a tornado and wrap around his body and give him third-degree burns all over his body from head to toe. I mean, it's well-known story. Uh, it's well known in New Orleans that there are headless Mardi Gras Indian shadows that roam the streets. If you ever seen like um, the Mardi Gras Indians, like the guys that dress up and they have all the feathers um, at night, people will see those headless Indians in their houses, especially those who live around the places where the Mardi Gras, Mardi Gras Indians would like march and meet and fight and murder each other. Like people don't even know that about New Orleans. Like the Mardi Gras Indian tribes are derived from real Indian tribes that black slaves made it with. And prior to the laws being the way you couldn't murder somebody, they would march across the city with shotguns and machetes 
and kill each other <laughs> and just whack each other right there in the street. And so um, people have no clue what they're dealing with when they come to New Orleans. I mean, they have no clue. They just be like, yeah, it's great. And I'm like, no, you're an idiot. It's like, sit down, bro. Relax. I had a couple of questions for you. Uh, Eric Testerman wants to know, are the voodoo zombies real? From what I know, hell yeah, they're real. And uh, someone else asked, I don't know if I can find it, what the five boxes were. Oh, um, box number one is location. And location is the main box. Then the sub boxes of that is you need a waterway and you need fertile soil. That's your three boxes. Then the next box is you need um, their interpersonal boxes. So you either need to be a person who's had a family who's had paranormal encounters um, historically or a person who finds themselves in a state of brokenness meaning something has gone terribly wrong in your life. And those are the five boxes. If you focus on the first three, you'll notice that um, over time, it, it, the information came out. I think it was Vic that brought this out, that it was land near cornfields or soil fields and rivers, right? Um, and so that's primarily location. Like you won't have those cryptid encounters in downtown New Orleans. You're just not going to have it. Now, you can have it in a place like New Orleans East, um, Michu, where you're going to have swamps and bodies of water, and it's still fertile land out there where people actually grow stuff in their backyards and do those things. But then you combine the history of New Orleans and the family history of New Orleans, and you'll find that a lot of people in New Orleans have had paranormal activities. It's, it's, I think back in the day, I used to say that paranormal is the normal in New Orleans. <laughs> Because people would tell you stories about, yeah, you know, I remember when my grandmother died and, you know, we were all sitting in the living room and two days after she died and her rocking chair is just rocking back and forth. And everybody's like, oh, grandma's in her chair. And it just keep on going on about their business. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so those are your five boxes. If you don't check all if you don't check enough of those boxes, man, you really don't have anything to worry about. I mean, there's other boxes that branch off from each. But those are your five main boxes. I uh, I think those are those are uh, a good guideline definitely. Um, it's it's funny how many of these the well some of the more shall we say uh, credible stories that I've heard che hit those checkbox. Uh, and then you know of course you'll run into other stories that don't make any sense uh, that don't check any of them. They're like okay why would it even have been there in the first place? Uh, but yeah yeah it makes a lot of sense that that sighting and encounters would would fit within those criteria yeah and there are definitely outlier encounters where it just none of the stuff adds up but when you when you look at it from a data-driven perspective 90 percent of it falls within the the margins of those boxes then there's stuff that's outside of the box that just doesn't make sense and i find those things to be more curious than the things that are inside of the box um, because that's where you're trying to figure out, well, why in the hell did that happen? And for me, it's, okay, I start with the witness, and if it's outside all of those boxes, none of the stuff is matching what happened traditionally to people, then I really focus on that witness. I say, okay, let me take a lot of time with this person and go through every little minor detail, because now I'm thinking you're lying. And you need a starting point, a base point, to determine truth and lie. And so if you have those boxes and the, the subsets under them, then you have a basis for what is truth, right? Now, it doesn't mean that somebody can't lie to you, but you have to have some confidence in what's going on. For example, if as a police officer, if you go to a scene, you see a dead body, you see gun shell casings, you see holes in the body, you know the person was shot, right? Um, it's just, and so you need that initial criteria to have an understanding of what's going on. Um, and to relate it to something else, like let's say it's cold outside at night, um, the snowy environment, like where Doc is, and we find a dead body frozen with a hole in the body, look like something stabbed it, but we don't we don't find a weapon. It could be somebody stabbed the person with an icicle, right? And yeah. it melted because the body was still warm, and that would be an outlier. But because you you, thought, you wouldn't think that somebody grab an icicle and stab somebody, but they would. So that could be what happened. 
And so you have those outliers and things that just don't make sense that you really have to focus on. And those are the ones that I spend the majority of time vetting. It's like, nah, I want to figure this crap out. Like how, why, what was this? What was that? Um, and some of those end up being the best, really the best stories. Um, they really do. Boys jump on in there. I, I'm, I'm kind of, kind of, uh, uh, taking up all the time here asking questions. I'm, I'm just taking in the, this is, this is fun. <laughs> yeah. I'm just enjoying it. I, uh, I am. I am going to say that I think we ticked off about four of those five boxes the other night. Yeah, when we were having Joe Bald. Wait, what did you guys do? We went out to an old abandoned campground here in Missouri on, was it Friday night? Yeah, Friday night. No, no <clears throat> either Friday or Saturday, I think. It's Friday night. Remember. Saturday, we were That's house. right. It was Friday night. We went to your house on Saturday night. Well, uh, we Working went down to shift, old, My days get crossed up. There's an abandoned campground here in Missouri called the Joe Bald, Joe Bald Recreation Area that they shut the campground down back around 1999-2000 after a number of people went missing. And every time they've attempted to reopen that campground, the Army Corps of Engineers has stepped in and shut it down. Well, it looked like they were going to try to open it again. They were building a dock out there, for, you know, like a marina. And when we went out there Friday night, it was gone, 100% gone. Uh, there were a couple of uh, trucks out there that just said 24 hour repair that seemed to be watching us. Um, they wasn't, it wasn't like a business name. It just said 24 hour repair on the side. There were panel trucks. Um, and while we got out and were filming and walking around the, the, the campground, we found down by the, in the mud next to the water, we found, what was that about an 18 inch track, uh, Robbie? Somewhere six, between 16 and 18 inches, yeah. Good size track. And not far from it, we found a very large canine track. Well, it was late. We didn't have any casting material with us. I said, I told Robbie, I said, why don't we get first thing in the morning, grab some plaster of Paris and come down here and kind of come back down here and cast these tracks. So we, you know, we got them on film, but you know, we were wanting to come back and cast them. So we left, you know, a little while later after we'd wandered around the campground for a while. Um, uh, we followed something with you know something big that had an eye shine in the trees and it disappeared on us. Um, but then we we you know the next morning we came back down with casting materials and it, somebody had driven like through the rocks down to the water's edge, driven over those tracks and then backed up over the same tracks and left. They just drove down there with the intent purpose of driving over those tracks that we were going to cast. Sound like y'all don't need to be going back over there no more. That's what it sounds like to me. It sound like, and it don't. It sounds like the reason why people are going missing is because they making them people go missing because they don't want you to find nothing over there. You know what did, I'm saying? Did y'all see I shine in the same area? Me and you saw I shine, da. Totally different area. It's closer to the lake. Huh. Aha. Uh-huh. Aha. Uh-huh. So while we were down there, when we found the tracks had been destroyed, we went over to where we, where I was tracking the the I shine the night before and actually went into the bushes to the area where it was at. And uh, the eye shine would have had to have been about seven feet off the ground. And it was in an area where there weren't enough thick. It was a br- it was brush. It wasn't like heavy branches. Uh, so there was no way it was an owl sitting on one of these thin branches. Uh, so, you know, the, whatever it was, was moving and I could see it moving. And uh, then it just just like ducked down and was gone. Uh, ground was pretty hard in that area. We couldn't get any tracks, but Robbie did find a paw print, a canine paw print. It was about six inches across. Yeah, that's uh, that's no bueno, bro. That was so, a big, big print. Yeah, that's no bueno. The simple fact that they're there, the people are there monitoring the area, lets you know that the activity is there. In my mind, the thing to do I would say screw not I'm not telling you to follow don't do this don't listen to me and go do this I would say screw all the freaking um footprints I would just go knock on the window like yo what up homie what's up man how long y'all been working out here y'all ever seen anything weird out here man I would just be like I was out here the other night and I saw these eyes shining man you look like y'all out here 24 hours huh you ever see I and I would just read those people and you're gonna know immediately What's going out there? Going on out there? You're gonna have all the valid proof you need based on how they respond to you. Now, if you guys are listening in the 24-hour trucks right now, I want you to know I don't live anywhere near there. I have no interest in. <laughs> I could give a damn about your 24-hour patrol 
I wish you the best of luck. I hope you got the right weapons. I know you know what you're doing, but I'm just saying, if it was me, gentlemen, I would just knock on the window and have a conversation with you. I'm not finna run around in the woods with the monsters. And you can just be mean or you could be nice. I'm going to know based on what you say what's really going on. Like, I'm going to know immediately. And we probably that saves a whole bunch through. of trouble. You know what I'm saying? We probably should have just walked over and introduced ourselves. I'm the exact opposite. I'm the stupid guy that went running around the woods in the dark. Yeah, I ain't doing it, bro. That's that's horrifically terrifying, bro. Yeah, y'all got balls of steel. Like after some of the things that I've talked to eyewitnesses about that they've seen in the woods, that's not Dog Man and not Bigfoot. I'm I have no interest. The guy invited me to come out to north of Dallas and stay in his cabin in the woods his, on his family property. He's like, man, you know, we'll we'll talk about real estate deals. You can come out, spend the weekend with me, and blah, blah, blah. I said, listen, bro, I'll tell you what. I got a counter offer. I said, you come down to New Orleans. We're going to set up an Omni Hotel. I'm going to take you out. We're going to hang out. We're going to do all that same stuff here. No, I prefer you to come out here. Well, bro, we're just not going to do no deal because I'm not sitting in no damn cabin in the woods. You don't understand what's in them woods. He's like, what are you talking about? I was like, never mind, bro. I'm, I'm not doing it. The <laughs> dark waters like you like. Have you ever seen a horror movie? That's how it always starts out. <laughs> yeah, that's how it always starts out. And you want the black guy to go in the woods? I'm gonna die real quick, bro. <laughs> I'm dead. I'm dead. And then I'm a little overweight too, and I can't run now, nah, bro. Hell no. I ain't out running nothing. I ain't no. I know better. I ain't playing them kind of games. <laughs> After we left the old campground, we went down to another area, river access called Blunk Road. It, it's a creepy area. I set one of my books in that area. Uh, so we drove down to Blunk Road just so I could show it to Robbie. And as we're approaching the river, I see something in the road ahead of us. And I'm like, what the heck is in the road? And so I start slowing down. I got the headlights on bright. And Robbie leans forward. And he goes, that's a deer's head. And sure enough, it was the head of a deer just laying in the middle of the road. See what I'm saying? Now, let me ask y'all a question. Let me interview y'all about this. So y'all see this deer head in the middle of the road. What's the first thing that come to mind, Robbie? What's the first thing you think? First thing I thought was I want to get out and see if it was clean cut or jagged tears on it. And wrong. What about you, DA? What was the first thing you thought? <laughs> my, my first thought was what the hell happened down here? Why is there a deer and head in the middle of the road? Wrong. Both of y'all dead. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all dead. My first thought would have been Robert and be like, uh, James, that looks like a deer head in the road. I'd have been like, all right, so how can I get control of this vehicle and turn it around and get the hell out of here? How do I get them to turn this car around right now so we can leave? And that would have been my whole mindset. Hey, bro. And you would have heard me. I've been in the car. Listen, bro. I'd have been like, listen, 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 listen. I told y'all, listen, like nine times to make sure you would hear me. Listen, 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 listen. Say, bro, we need to leave. Well, we want to see the deer head. No, fuck that deer head, man. We don't need to. Let's go. What are we going to do? We can't <laughs> We can't help that deer, man. What are you talking about? We need to leave. But it may be evidence, man. Fuck that evidence. I'm telling you, why would a deer head be in the middle of the road? That's all you need to understand. Something put it there. We need to go. And guess what? I would have talked y'all into leaving. Oh, I would have got out the truck and I would have started going the other direction. And y'all would have picked me up on the way out. And out of, on my way out, I've been talking to everything. Listen, Bigfoot, Dog Man, Rakes, I'm leaving. They are staying. Go talk to them. I'm leaving. And that'd have been that. And y'all would have been like, man, DW literally started walking down the dark road by himself, leaving you. Damn right, I'm gone. Because that can only end bad. <laughs> well, we didn't stick around very long. We didn't get any internet signal down there, so you know we couldn't. Li we were going to live stream it. And uh, we we couldn't get any signal down there, so we didn't stay but about 10 minutes. Like, I don't see how that ends good in any way, shape, or form. Like, I don't see any winning scenario with <laughs> that. Like, let's, all right, let's watch. We pull up. Er, stop. Hop out. We got the headlight shining on it. So now the headlight shining, and you're blinded because you got the headlight shining, and you can't see what's in the woods. All right, so that's a bad scenario by itself. But we out in front of the headlights looking at the deer head. Okay, let's look. Is it a jagged cut? Is it a straight cut? I don't think the cut really matters because in my mind, either there's a human being out there that's a psycho that decided to cut a deer's head off with a knife and drop it in the middle of the road. He's a problem. Or there's something that ripped the deer's head off and dropped it in the middle of the road. 
that thing is a problem. So I don't see a win. It's not a win in the situation at all. You know what I'm saying? I just don't see us winning. I'll be, that will be my selling point, guys. I don't see how we win, baby. How do we win? We losing. Right now, we losing. We need to go. Take a picture. Let's roll. Well, we did that. I'm, I'm, got, I'm still working on the videos that we took while we were down there. But, you know, it, it was an interesting time. Uh, that wasn't the only parts of deer carcasses we found. Farther down by the river, we actually found uh, a deer that had pretty much had the carcass stripped. Uh, and the top of its skull was gone. Yep. The, 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 the compartment where the brain was at was empty. And then another one had both back legs ripped off. Mm -hmm. And then there was one that was just... The spine and the rib cage and the yeah. front legs. Something kind of is, if, and then if there it was, was a, people, you know, we you know, we get it, but they feel they completely gutted and stripped all of the meat down to skeleton of, of, of an entire carcass. And then there was just a hide. Yeah, no bones one hide or nothing. Just laying one, on the ground. One just been hide. torn off. And Don, uh the head that we saw, saw at first, it was jagged cuts. It wasn't it wasn't a clean cut, so. But and the horns, the, the, the head a, in the road also was missing the soft tissue of its nose and one of its eyes. The the strange thing about the one in the road was the cuts on the neck were jagged, but the horns were cut smooth off, and the eye was completely. I don't know if it was missing or if it. It looked like it was missing to me. But so I think some person cut the uh, cut the horns off, but it doesn't didn't appear to me that somebody cut the head off. It, it, right. The head looked like it'd been torn off. Uh, I'm going to keep it 100 percent real with y'all. If all four of us in that situation. I'm pulling a race card on y'all to get out of there. I'm going to be just like this. Y'all want my black ass to die. I'm ready to go home. I'm going off on y'all because none of that that you just said makes any sense whatsoever. Deer head in the road, antlers cut off. So what you're trying to tell me is somebody else drove down here, saw this deer head in the middle of the road, and they said, oh, hey, this is a deer head. Let me cut the antlers off and take it home. That don't make no damn sense. Who does that? Mm -mm, I'm gone, bro. I'm like, bro, I'm black. We don't do this. I'm pulling every race car. Black people don't do this. I'm leaving. Let's go. I'm calling the police. I'm going to tell them out here with y'all. Y'all trying to kill me. I'm getting anything I could do to get the hell out of these woods is, <laughs> is what I'm doing, bro, because that don't make no sense. And then to oh. find the other caucuses with the legs thrown off, man, you know that's pure dog man, Bigfoot crap right there all day long. You know what I'm saying? Like straight mm -hmm. up just ripping that's the dog. That's, that's them. 100%. That's the stuff they do. You know what I'm saying? And then if you find one caucus, I'm pretty sure if you just fanned out into the area and looked around, you're going to find a hell of a lot more. And I'm pretty I would, sure that if I would there was say a there was enough out there. There was, a, there was enough remains for uh to add, add up to three deer from my estimations. Did y'all see any corral points, any choke points out there? Yeah, right where the uh, mm -hmm. where the Mass where the, where the bulk, bulk of the bones were was a choke point, and so y'all went into the choke point and y'all knew well, it was we, a choke point. We were all armed, trust me. Yeah, man, y'all some wild boys, man. Y'all need to be on TV with uh, them swamp people because y'all on that shoot them stuff. Y'all about that action. I ain't gonna lie. No, 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 y'all about that action. I gotta give y'all y'all props. <laughs> Roxanne Delgado <laughs> said, Tell him living in the Ozarks, anything can happen here. <laughs> ding, 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 ding. Yeah. Well, we were right along a river, but none of us were canoeing. <laughs> and it did well, go there, to there were boats out there, and there were a couple boats out there, night fishing and gigging. And I'll tell you the funny thing, like just in this conversation, y'all, you're really just disclosing a way to actually find their feeding areas. All you got to do is find a corral and the choke points in the woods and you're going to find where they've been trapping and, and killing their food. I mean, it's it's that simple to find them. That's why when people be like, I'm a dog man investigator and I've been going into the woods and I'm like, bro, if you understand what's what, 
you can walk right up to where they are just like yeah. the the crossings on the side of the road if you know what to look for for a crossing you gonna find where they crossed across the road uh, and that's one of the things i never understood you know there's people who say they've been investigating and been field investigators for 20 years and i'm like bro you suck at investigating if you've been doing something for 20 years and these things i don't go in the woods but i know these things from talking to eyewitnesses you should know these things so well, it's just crazy it, it's it's all about knowing what like you just said knowing what to look for like i spent what five minutes explaining to you and noah about what to look for on the trees you know look if you see a break go back and break it a little bit further to see and compare I, I spent five minutes explaining that to him and within five minutes of that conversation noah had already found like three or four different signs and mm -hmm. and we ended up try, me and him worked our way all the way around and that's where we found that little ambush point and that's you know i got it how i found it was we were looking at and i told da i said well, let's do a little experiment i said i'm gonna i'm gonna get on my hands and knees and i'm gonna crawl back in this little little ambush choke point and i want y'all to walk back up the trail and you know where i'm at you know what i'm dressed in i had on camouflage pants and a black uh black pullover i said tell me when you can see me so da and noah walked back 10 yards or so maybe not even that wasn't very far. Turn, turn around and knew where I was at. Knew exactly where to look. And DA said, "Dude, I can't see you. You're gone. You, you're." Had, had I not known he was there, if I was just walking down that trail, I'd have been on top of him before I even saw him. As it as it stands, though, he got within three yards of me before he could, because he was looking for me. Knew where to be looking. Within three yards, he could see me. So we're sitting there talking, and I have, and I had, you know, I was down on my hands and knees, and I had my hands spread out on i was on my knuckles and i just have happened to look down and right in between my hands i start looking and i start moving leaves and i'm like I looked up i said uh da he goes no way i said yeah he said you found a track i said yep so i took this knife right here and you can see how i got big hands you can see how mm -hmm. big that is compared to my hand the paw is bigger than that knife wow yeah we've got pictures of it for scale that's probably what we're going to be talking about on saturday is showing some of the videos we took and and some of the pictures we took down there let me ask you guys this question when you were in there did you see anything that could help mass the scent of the cryptid did you see any like they there brought was, something into the area certain leaves certain branches something that would mask there, their smell there was a lot of milk thistle in there that uh, or milkweed, whatever you, I don't know whatever I call it milk thistle, but that you know what I'm talking about, dark water stuff. Mm -hmm. I know exactly what you're talking about. There was there was like four or five of those right in on both sides of where I was crouched down. Um, there was obviously there was a lot of cedar trees around there, so mm -hmm. you had that, and basically that we were on a man-made game trail. It's a trail that they cut in, and it cut, curves back around and goes back down to the lake. Because before I saw the ambush spot, I was already looking on the road. I found deer, hog, uh, I think maybe raccoon. I found a, you know, just where they were following that game trail. And that's why, how, how Noah and I looked over. I said, well, look at that. I said, I bet you anything. That's a, that's an ambush point. You know, I'll tell you guys something funny. Like, this is the thing that, that cracks me up about this field. So, I take a data-driven approach, right? It's all about really digging into the details, right? Don't go in the field at all because I'm afraid to, and I ain't scared to tell nobody I'm afraid to, and I'm a man about it, and I'll fight you before I go out there. But if you know, you know because you have the data. Like, And people don't think about it like this. People say, oh, there was a dogman encounter, and I'm a dogman investigator. There's things that, that have to take place for their ambushes to work and they have to mask their scent and so you touched on one of the things about it being around cedar trees about milk, milk thistle these are all the things that um that come out in really talking to eyewitnesses because they have to have certain criteria in order for it to work think about it anybody's been in the vicinity of a bigfoot I mean, they'll describe the smell of a bigfoot anybody's mm -hmm. been in the vicinity of a dog man will describe the smell of it a human can pick that up so a deer is definitely going to pick it up, right? And so mm -hmm. when you start talking about hunting them down, then you know what you need to look for. That's why I say it's not hard to find. 
you know what you need to look for to find them um and then get into those areas and uh, to the people listening i hope you guys understand like that's a nugget that they just revealed to you guys during conversation that you don't hear that kind of stuff anywhere because it's never really about it's all about oh i saw a dog man but it's not the fine details that lead to an understanding of what it takes to hunt a cryptid. Like I'm a hundred percent positive. If I decide to go into the woods, I could find one that I don't want to though. I'm a hundred percent positive about it. I don't want to. Uh, I have I've talked to too many eyewitnesses. Like you take blue, right? Watch this. The guy who saw dog man down in Fort Pierce, Florida, this, this wild story. Nobody ever knows. Like, you know, he saw it live on Facebook. Um, days later, and him and his friends went out into the woods and was looking around. Days after that, the white truck show up, shut down the whole neighborhood. The stuff that he kind of talked about, but he didn't. Shut down the whole neighborhood. The whole neighborhood goes into fear. Days after that, people see it again on top of a rock. Days after that, they don't see it. Everything chills. Everything goes normal. His life goes to crap. Like, literally goes to crap. I mean, <laughs> You know, mold in the house, he gets sick, goes into the hospital, almost dies, has a near-death experience, comes back, has a fight with his neighbor, um, about to go to prison, um, comes back. Well, he's he about to go have a fight with his neighbor, he's about to go to prison. He can't live in the house anymore for a while. He has to move away because now there's a restraining order against him from coming to his own house, which he lives in a duplex. Turns out that the restraining order was put in by somebody else not the people who lived in the house he just had the argument with him later on it turns out that the people who had the argument was paid to have the argument with him all these things going on that nobody talks about on the back end like it just and it's mind-blowing to me that nobody ever talks about it i mean and then people be like oh it's a conspiracy hell yeah they got some conspiracies surrounding this i mean a hundred percent conspiracies <laughs> Well, just, and so, just like the twenty-four hour service vans that are out there the night before when we're out there, no reason for them to be down there. There's not even electricity in the park. They no, was looking for y'all. No, Speaking of not not all, not uh, no electricity in the park, I remember camping in that campground when I was a kid. It was open, you know, up until about the year two thousand. Those were those were all primitive campsites. There was no water or electricity hookups for RVs. These were just you know. Campsites you pull in, you build a fire, and, you know, and all you have is a picnic table and a fire pit. That's pretty much all it's any, any, any of those. Uh, up at the front of the uh, of the park, there was an area where you could you uh, you could dump your your uh, your gray water, black water tanks from your RV, but there were no power hookups anywhere in the, any of these campsites. In the woods, we found two massive power boxes for a park with no power to it. Mm. That's wild. That's curious. That's real. Yeah, we're curious. trying to figure that out too. Where'd y'all find them at? Up in that area where those picnic tables were, further back. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Got a super chat from from uh, S Dresden. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. And Doc, guess what else we found that night? What's that? A brand new tag. Yeah. And we've got pictures of that. There was the, the front tag of a car that it was just had obviously just been been purchased. It was bought in July, uh, June of this year, June and didn't expire year. until twenty five. The entire mounting bracket had been ripped off the front of the car. Where was it? In the woods? Yeah, up there, right by close close to where you and I spot the spot of the eye shine. <laughs> Look at the time. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, I wanted to go further at that point. Noah, Noah kept saying, "Uh, guys, we're getting a little far away from the car." Uh, guys, <laughs> get... translations. Robbie, turn around and come back this way. You're you're being an idiot and walking further into the woods. I'm with it you, was, Noah. It was getting pretty close to the point where we could have easily been cut off from our only means of escape. <laughs> nope. That's uh, that that's you guys got a real active area. You know, real active area. And again, to the 24-hour security people that's listening, this is a hobby. We're just interested in talking about it. If you see, you know, them out in the woods just looking around, just have a conversation. You know what I'm saying? And that's all it is. It's, it's all about conversation, man. You know, I see them down there again. I'm gonna, I'm, I'll just go up and introduce myself, give them one of my business cards, and tell them I'm a writer. Um, Kay Bowers says, uh, "Da, ask about Dog Man Island." 
Um, what about Dogman Island? It's down by Morgan City. It's a real location, real place. Um, there's only been one other person that went there or tried to get there, and that didn't go well for him at all. <laughs> that, that didn't go well for him at all. Um, and I know three guys just dumb enough to try to go there. Yeah, I wouldn't advise. I'll tell you like this. When I first started putting out stories with the real locations, I was completely oblivious to people like 24-hour security. Like, it was just like, yeah, I'm going to tell this freaking story. This is a great story. Da, da, da. Then I realized those people actually exist. Then I realized there's other things that those people do to discourage people from going out to those locations. And some of them, some of, some of the things that they're able to do defy all logic. For example, you decide you want to go to Dogman Island, you ride out on your boat, you're heading in a direction, you done figured out exactly where it is, and then you just lose time. I'm not talking about, you know, an hour. I'm talking about a whole damn day. You don't know what you did that whole day. You remember launching the boat, and next thing you know, you you in your truck, your boat is on your trailer, and you don't know what the hell happened. And so um, there's things that go on in this field, and I, and I don't think I've ever talked about this, but I'll say this here. There's things that go on in this field that eyewitnesses encounter that have to do with advanced technology that clearly is being used to protect locations. Again, that's something that nobody really talks about. And to me, that's the most terrifying thing there is. I mean, um, it's, it's utterly frightening. It, that's and, and I'll say this. Man. In many cases where people have spoken about, um, what do they call it? They had a term for it where it was like, oh, you know, I went looking for Bigfoot and it hit me with infrasound. Infrasound, I yeah. I'll, I'll suggest this to you. You may think that's Bigfoot hitting you. That might not be Bigfoot hitting you with that. Nose that's bleed, some, that's some men bleed. in black neuralizer stuff. There you go. And But the way it was quantified in the field was, oh, I got hit with infrasound. But when you start talking to eyewitnesses and you're like, and they get hit with something as soon as they get out the car in this location and they ain't seen no cryptid. It's like, well, what's that about? And then when you get a data set where there's 20 people that encountered the same thing, I just stepped foot into the woods and I got hit with something. My nose started bleeding. I started feeling dizzy and I had to go back to my car. That ain't, that ain't damn Bigfoot, a dog man. But, and I'll go a little bit deeper. I'll tell you that certain narratives in this field are injected into this field. So, for example, let's say the four of us are men in black, right? And we're sitting around smoking cigars, and we're like, yeah, these idiots want to go out to the woods. They're looking for Bigfoot, right? And I'd be like, Robbie, they're on their way. Hit them with that, hit them with that weapon. Robbie, hit them. <laughs> they all fried up, bleeding out the eyes, bleeding out the ears, booty hole hurting, trying to figure out what happened to them. And then we like, <laughs> and we like, man, we gonna have to come up with a way to explain this, this shit that we done did. Oh man, let's tell them it was infrasound. So then here comes the eyewitness, come along. They go on any, they can go on four or five podcasts. Yeah, man, I was in the woods and I believe I got hit with infrasound. And the next thing you know, it takes off like wildfire. Yeah, infrasound, 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 because it's real easy to inject something into the conversation and people just run with it and now you have infrasound and now you have the cover up right in front of you i'm just saying that's how these things work again 24 hours security i don't well, need no smoke i don't need no zero zero phone calls but i'm just telling you guys that's we had that da and i had that exact conversation just not with that example but all the the portals and all that kind of stuff. We, you know, we believe this, this just a, you know, a creature that's got adaptive camouflage. It is stands still clear hair follicles. It blends in with its natural surroundings. It looks like it just disappears because it's standing still. So all this, this portal stuff didn't start till like the seventies, mm -hmm. you know, Bigfoot, Sasquatch, whatever, whatever the name may be goes way further back than that. But this portal stuff and going into mind speak and yeah, mind speak and all that stuff didn't start in the seventies. What else happened wow. that was significant around the seventies, though? 
MK Ultra. What about in the Bigfoot world? When was the uh, that uh, film recorded? Sixty. Patterson Gimlin was in sixty-seven, wasn't seven? it? Seven. Yeah, sixty-seven. I believe. So yeah. So three years later, we have interjections into the film. Now I'll tell you this: there are real portals in the in the woods. I mean, there's real portals. There's some ridiculous. Oh, crap. I, I don't. I don't. It ain't. I don't doubt the existence of portals. CERN proved that, but. All the stuff of Bigfoot uses portals. That's why you can't find them. I'm not saying it's not possible. I just think it's an animal. Yeah, I mean, there's 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 evidence for it being an animal. There's evidence for it being a demon. There's evidence for it being a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I'll say this: circling back to the point of thing things being in, interjected. <coughs> yeah, that's something that people need to be mindful of. Um, and if you really pay attention, you can tell when something new is being interjected into the community because it'll be a narrative that takes off like wildfire. And you're like, man, where this crap came from? Like, wh wh where did this come from? You know, the blue is everywhere overnight. Um, and so um, you can see it. You can see it. And if you trace it back, you always find it started with an eyewitness on an interview and they've done multiple interviews over multiple channels. And then it's like that eyewitness drops off the face of the earth. And it's easy to do because content wise, because it's a content creation field, um, it's very easy because podcasters need content. So if you can put together, formulate a story with enough truth that meets certain criteria and then interject what you want into it, wham, you got what you need. <coughs> Doc, you all right? I think he tried to breathe his water. <laughs> Yeah, my nose is running like crazy, and I'm <clears throat> trying to inhale water. Never good. Sorry. <clears throat> no, and what y'all are talking about it definitely has merit, man. I mean, that's a good theory. I've never really thought about that, about the hit them with something, make them forget stuff. That's what happens. I, mean, I could do what it without the hurting, but <laughs> <laughs> that was just me being crazy. Nobody's bum holes working. I was just being funny. But I mean, have, how many stories have you heard about people? Not only the dizziness and things like that, but nausea, throwing up. That's that's a directed energy weapon. Headaches. A lot. A lot. I've that's seen my own investigator go through it, where he was in the field. Um, it really got popular when we were doing the cameras and for the longest he didn't have a problem then he started seeing people on the property and then he went out one night and he got hit with something and dizziness nausea nosebleeds and he was out for 48 hours so i mean it's true that's the stuff that happens well, we know the military has been using directed energy weapons, not just microwaves, but sonics. Um, you know, then we know they've been, they've just got weapons designed like that for crowd control. I mean, it would only make sense; it would have an adverse effect on whatever it hit. Mm -hmm. But it begs the next question: Is why? What about this is so significant that you have to take those measures? Um, and this is what I've been trying to figure out: What is so significant that you need to take those measures to cover things up? I mean, what's so important about it, you know? Um, I haven't been able to wrap my mind around it. I mean, on a base level, if the American citizens knew that there were monsters in the woods, would they freak out? Probably so. But tomorrow, Beyonce will have a concert. Some celebrity will show their boob, and everybody will forget about it. So, um, for example, you take Alien Disclosure. Oh, it was huge. We saw videos of flying pyramids, and it was like two days, and then everybody went on about their business. Then we had whatever happened in South America. I forgot where it was, Peru or whatever. There was pictures of aliens walking down the streets, and everybody forgot about it. Yeah, Las Vegas, some green thing slams out of the sky. It was hot for three days, and everybody forgot about it. And so that's the thing for me that doesn't make sense. You know, 24-hour security you guys can help us with that. It just don't make no sense, homie. Like, what, what's the what's the point of doing all that stuff if you know that people are going to forget about it? You know what I'm saying? Unless yeah. 
there's something more to it. And that's something more. I'm not sure about it yet. I'm not sure if I want to know what it is. And if I had figured it out, I don't think I would talk about it. I'd put it like that. Yeah, it's probably one of those things, if you talk about it too much or too loudly, you become a statistic. I believe or, so. And so, or, the, or the next missing 411 case. I agree. 100%. Uh-oh, hold on a second. It's not like uh, our government hasn't made people shut up and disappear before. No. Absolutely. And they've done it quite publicly, too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah. People who had names that was like, oh, yeah, that guy just went missing. What? Or so and so, you know, you know the, well, in, in certain cases, uh, a lot of, uh, well, just say a lot of suicides mysteriously follow a certain political family. Yeah. Yeah, they found you in a. Uh, they found you stuffed in a black bag in a closet, and it was suicide. In a <laughs> Never gym found bag. the murder. Oh, yeah, that was suicide. Was suicide yeah. <laughs> yeah, he stuffed himself in a trunk, and it was suicide. Okay, buddy. Yeah, sealed himself in there and suffocated himself with three bullet holes in the back of his head. I mean, that's obvious, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, um, you know, that's where. And I'm confident, and I'll tell anybody this all day long, like, there's people that I've met in this field that started in this field that was like, I'm going to get to the truth, and I'm going to tell the truth, and and this and that. And I'd be like, you know, there's a thin line between entertainment and truth. And some truths, the trouble that come along with it is not worth it. And then when you really, I'll tell you what really gets me, it's really gotten me, is that... um. You can give, like Blue's evidence was the perfect example of it. Caught on Facebook live stream, can't be CGI, can't be anything. It's Fort Pierce, Florida. He opens the door. You see the dog man run. You slow it down. You see the hunch on his back. You see the back hind legs. You see everything. And over time, um, narratives were created that it was a spirit horse. It was a ghost frog. It was all these other different things. You combine the fact that he had pictures of it standing in the tree line where you can see a black wolf with a gold eye and then other pictures where you could see another cryptid, which was clearly a damn Bigfoot with a head the size of a car tire um, in the same area. Um, Had that footage not been vetted by four TV channels, it would have been swept under the rug and people would have discredited it. But the only reason why it couldn't be discredited was because people paid for that footage and put it on national TV. Hmm. And so it couldn't be discredited. But the shows came out, you know, it was hot for a minute, and then wham, it was gone. And people are always looking for the next piece of evidence. And I haven't figured this out. And there's no other field that I've worked in where you get ample evidence of something and it's not established as there being truth. You know what I'm saying? Like if I got a video footage of this thing running across the screen, it's running as fast as lightning. And that's the descriptions that eyewitness, eyewitnesses have said and meets the exact description, then that's that. That's it. That's what the thing is. You know what I'm saying? And that's how it goes. But in this field, you need more. I need more. I need more. Um, and I, I don't get that. So it's like, you can roll out any evidence you want. It's going to have an expiration date on it because people are going to be looking for more. So there's no end to it to me. That's why you won't find me in the field. Cause I feel like the four of us can go into the woods today and we can have the best camera. We can have a drone. We can get evidence of Bigfoot. We can put it out. Um, it's going to be taken, chopped up into pieces, monetized and put out there. And then people are looking for more. Well, you know, one of the things we've always said is we have no intention of being the guys that bring home the mystery. Uh, We don't want to be the guy that goes out and bags a Bigfoot and brings it in. I have no intention of doing that. We just have a good time going out in the woods and looking at looking around at the at the strange things we can find. And sometimes we get a good print on camera or, or can cast it. And then sometimes we come up with nothing. Uh, sometimes just, somebody drives across it. Sometimes somebody destroys your cat, your cat, your your uh, prints. 
but uh we it's just something we enjoy doing we all like going out in the woods we all have been deer hunters at point some point in our careers and uh you know we vote uh, robbie and i are both you know are both law enforcement and doc was was a uh, military so we we just you know maybe we're just old adrenaline junkies still looking for something to excite us once in a while but we just enjoy doing it and it's it's not something we're trying to prove to anybody um and you know they can they can take it at what for what it is i mean we don't tell anybody that we're presenting the truth uh we're just you know presenting what we found and they can take that with a grain of salt they can agree with us they can disagree with us but it's in the end it's just us collecting stories it's just us looking for the truth to satisfy ourselves and i think that's the only approach that you can take honestly um because any other approach i found that any other approach is going to leave you highly disappointed um highly 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 disappointed um for example there's another video that blue has that when we were negotiating i told him to hold on to that video for a mat like a rainy day when he needed money and we're talking i'm like he's like man they want to buy the other video so bro put that on six different thumb drives go put it in a, a safety deposit box and one day you're gonna need some money and the day you need money i want you to go get that and i want you to go ahead and go back on tv and this time you're going to be able to charge double the amount and he was like well well he talks when he's like well dw why i don't understand why you want me i'm like listen you had about 90 days of shine and airtime off that first piece of evidence and you had the opportunity to um to monetize it and help you and your family you just have you have a, a savings account right there brother and i said just keep it as a savings account i said because if you just release it everybody's going to monetize it and it's going to be gone and so um unfortunately when you look at it from that perspective and you truly look at the field that we're in that's the way some of these things need to be handled because other than that it's just going to get, get out to the public it's going to be shoo shooed away and that's going to be a wrap i agree yep well and that, that's why we've always said you know we believe what we believe we're not trying to push our agendas or our beliefs or what we say on anybody else we just if we've got an idea we put it out there if you believe it you believe it if you don't that fine too it what we do is more for us and if somebody gets something out of it great if they don't you know it is what it is it, it doesn't it it's no skin off the three of our noses if nobody believes what we believe because the three of us have been through enough to work that's not gonna it's not gonna amount to a hill of beans to any one of us whether somebody says oh you're stupid I, okay probably yeah, it's just their opinion yeah i mean you know we, we've got our opinions the three of us are generally a hundred percent in agreement with each other on just about every opinion that we've got on this and it just it, it it's it is what it is it i don't know it's how that, else to say it it's just data points man like yeah. you're saying it's just data points we present the data and you if you choose to extrapolate more out of it than what the data says then that's an opinion because and we've said it multiple times on the show it doesn't matter what anybody says nobody's an expert on this it's all opinions theories conjectures that that's it there's there's nobody can say well it's my way or the highway people can say it and there are those that do and if you don't believe the way that those people believe then then you're the enemy which they've got more in common with a sith than they do anything else but you know we're the exact opposite we just we we put our opinion out there if you want to buy into what we say fine if you don't fine too yeah and that's the way it has to be um to get the broad spectrum of information out to the public I mean, you have to have dissenting opinions in order for the truth to come out. Um, and that's the only way it can work. Um, you need polar opposites. You need dissenting opinions. You need people who have different beliefs. And then you compare all the data to make it work. 
Um, and, and I tell my audience, the Dark Order family, who's been with me for a long time, I think they, they know to it, they come to expect that I'm going to give them uh, a broad range of evidence and information, but I'm still going to let them make up their own minds. You know what I'm saying? I, now, I can confidently say if I present something to you, I believe it to be true. And that's just, it is what it is. That's what I believe to be true. And I can explain how I came to my belief of it being true. Um, and I'm confident in my explanation. I'm confident in my tactics to get to the truth. So, um, and it's played out very well for me uh, getting to that point. Another case in point that I was thinking about as you guys described your background, I think your background might be why you have less trouble than some other people when you go out in the woods. Um, I don't think I'm pretty sure your background is the reason why you have a lot less trouble and a less harassment than the average person would when they go out into the woods, because there are certain things that men with your background understand. And, you know, the lines that are there inherently, they don't have to be explained to you, if that makes any sense. There's some people that are uh, enthusiasts, it's probably enthusiasts. Yeah, those are probably the, the best word. They're enthusiastic about it to the point to where they don't understand the unspoken like lines that are there. And so they just go skipping over the lines um, and coloring outside of the lines and then wonder why they have problems like, you know, freaking tax audits and names popping up on lists that they shouldn't be on and all kind of crazy stuff. And they're like, man, DW, why is this happening? I'm like, because you're a zealot and you need to stop being a freaking zealot, bro. Like what is wrong with you? Um, and so I think that's another thing that plays in uh, to not only your experiences with the other forces that are out there, but it actually heavily plays into your credibility. Like for me, from an eyewitness standpoint, if somebody is an ex-police officer, ex-military, um, there are certain standards, especially when you're dealing with police, there are certain standards of evidence gathering that when we have a conversation, you know they understand what they're talking about. You know how their brain functions as a police officer, and it's based on logic more than emotion. Um, and so they're taking a logical approach, even though it's an emotional situation. When they calm down, they're going to lean towards the logic and explain it from a logical perspective. So um, I think it's, it's a great makeup you guys have here to get out the truth and give real evidence to people. And the credibility is here to where you should be taken seriously. Um, yeah, definitely the credibility is there. Thank you. That's that's one of the things that we, we've all tried to do is when we do evidence collection, we try to treat it the same way we would if we were actually working a crime scene. I mean, you know, there are steps that should be taken to make sure things are preserved. Uh, you, can't, you just can't go willy-nilly and, and just, oh, well, I'll grab this and pick it up and because you're going to contaminate anything you might have collected. And uh, we, we try to take a very logical approach to stuff like this. And you're right. There are some, sometimes we're like, yeah, we might we might not need to push this one. Um, you know, we, we can see the warning signs of when we're getting those subtle hints that maybe we're getting a little too close to something. Uh, and I think we kind of got that out of Joe Bald when they destroyed our, our, our casts, our uh, tracks before we could get back. Uh, probably going to leave that place alone for a while. I don't blame you. I mean, if we talk about the place where you guys where they rolled over the footprints, bro. I, yeah. I don't. Or I don't blame you. I would. I would give it a little bit of a break. Um. Yeah, you're probably on the radar now. Yeah, I'm pretty sure you guys are on the radar. Um, oh, I'm, and, I'm sure we probably already were, but I'd say that certainly popped some flags up. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they went out of their way to make a point. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, they weren't subtle, not even slightly. <laughs> Oh, you, you could, you could tell it wasn't just somebody randomly drove through there. They drove down and lined themselves up perfectly where it would go through, right through that trackway, drove straight through, started turning to the left or to, excuse me, to the right, to the right. and then backed up and you could see where it backed off. And that, so there was basically four sets of tire tracks or four, four tire marks. Yeah. Two going in, and they turn and come back out. So it was intense. Oh, they made sure they had oh, right. we could you know, use. I mean, they just launching a boat, man. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Diag there, that Diagonal to the to the water. Yeah. 
<laughs> they were just launching the boat, man. That wasn't intentional at all. <laughs> and those, but those are the things that you got to be mindful of, man. I mean, to me, I've I've always said this. I've said, you know, the cryptos are terrifying, but the the things that the ancillary things that happen around them are even more terrifying, um, and they're more worrisome. I remember when. Um, I discovered a, a white vehicle sitting outside of my house for like three days. And I was like, okay, first day, my son's like, yo, pops, they got a white car sitting out there. Whatever, that might just be somebody. Second day, car pulls up again. I'm like, all right, well, what kind of crap is this? Third day, I take a pistol, go out there, tap on the window, and the guy doesn't seem bothered by it whatsoever. <laughs> it's like, like, yo, what you doing here, man? Just rose down the window. Well, Mr. Williams, I just wanted to let you know we enjoy your content. And I was like, holy crap, this is this is next level. <laughs> like this is next level stuff we're dealing with. Over time, I spent a significant amount of time talking to him and um, got a better understanding of, um, they call it expectations. I call it the line that's drawn in the sand. And it is what it is. You know what I'm saying? Um, I dance on the line, I jump over it, I spin around on it and I go my behind back where I belong. <laughs> and that's just that. Because there's no profit on the other side of the line. I mean, everybody who's everybody who's crossed it, there's not been any profit in it for them. And so it just doesn't make any sense. When I mean profit, I'm not talking about money. I mean, it's just not profitable to you as a human being. Exactly. Yeah, there's no good is going to come out of it. Yeah. Sorry, I was looking to see if I missed any questions. Hey, Greg. What's up, Greg? Hey, Greg. How you, How's your, how you feeling, dude? He's uh, got a pretty bad back injury. He's going to have to have surgery. That's never good. That's absolutely never good. Hope you get better Definitely. soon, Greg. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, 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 don't, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but how long can we keep you? Hey, man, I got... I go three cigars. I'm one and a half in, so we got plenty of time left. <laughs> That's how I judge my okay. shows. I didn't. I didn't want to. I, I didn't want to. You know, keep you later than you wanted to be. So if you uh, still got a cigar and a half to go, we, we got plenty of material. Yeah, we got plenty of time, man. I got plenty of stuff we can talk about. It's funny because I really do judge shows by cigars. I'm like, ah, this would be a one cigar show, <laughs> and uh, people be like, man, you was chewing on the cigars. Like, yeah, you don't understand. When that cigar was over, I was getting off. <laughs> I'm done. And so um, I go based on cigars. So I got plenty of time. And we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. I do want to, for the record, clarify something. Um, I don't know if the audience knows. I the I have never really spoken to you guys. And so as I'm, I'm getting to know and understand you guys, the audience, you listen to me live time analyze the things that they're saying and come to conclusions about them in this field. So I didn't know everybody was law enforcement or military. And and that's why I was mentioning the fact that it adds heavily adds to you guys' credibility. Um, I'm learning things as we go about you gentlemen. And I want that Thank to be you, understood. Sir. So it'd be clearly understood. Well, then I'll let you know something about myself. What kind of cigar are you smoking, Dark Waters? Because I'm a cigar guy myself. This is a Romeo and Juliet Reserve. Uh, uh -huh. Let me see. Robusto 18. What is this? 1875 and then i got some this is a i'm gonna smoke this next this is a gurkha payback Ooh, that's gurkha's my that's my brand i love yeah. my gurkha uh have you ever had uh the devastator the gurkha wait, devastator? Wait, yes i have had that before i've had that um bro I, when i tell you when it comes to cigars bro there's not many cigars i haven't smoked um, and my, but I love boutique cigars. My favorite cigar, and I tell people all the time, is from Cigar Factory in New Orleans. It's called the Big Easy. It's a 60 ring gauge, double Maduro, dipped in cognac and aged for 90 days. It's my favorite freaking that cigar. Sounds good. Ooh, what, mean, kind of, good. what kind of tones is it? Um, you get um, the Maduro really overshadows everything because it's double Maduro. Um, yeah. and so it's almost like truthfully, bro, it's like smoking 
almost like smoking marijuana because that's how strong <laughs> that's how strong it is and there's actually heroin there and so it's it you don't get like the the nutty flavors or the um any oaky flavor you just get pure unadulterated hardcore uh cognac flavor in smoke that just takes you to a whole nother place but i can't smoke them like i used to i used to smoke yeah. you know two three of those a day um but i, I can't smoke them like i used to when i was a younger man because it tears my throat up i'll be hoarse yeah. from smoking that cigar diesel and uh gurkha are my two my two go-to brands and i do like drew estates undercrown that's a good one and the white noise that drew estates made i don't think they make white noise anymore i've got a few left over from cigar fest but i don't think they even make the white noise anymore but that's that was a really good really good cigar the undercrown is a fantastic cigar man yeah. it really i really love the undercrown i think i've got maybe two or three of those left uh i try to save them for special occasions because th those are good but i a lot of people say they don't like them but i like drew estates uh acid and toast and all those the kind of the flavored type of cigars i think those like if you just want to a cigar just to smoke just to, you know that is not going to be real heavy or real you know that you just want to smoke a cigar i think those are great the toast and acid and uh want some others that they put out on that um i've never anything. tried the acid i mean i had people offer them to me like at, at um good habit cigar shop where i hang out down here um they be like jay smoke this and I'm like, i don't really want that bro like, that's not mine i think i've had one like flavored cigar and it just didn't sit right with me because of what i've smoked for so long it, it yeah. just didn't it didn't sit right because yeah, i didn't well, start it, on those type of cigars you know it, it's not something that i would smoke every single time i smoke a cigar but you know once in a may, maybe once every four or five months you know just something just a, a quick smoke you know, kind of like we talked about judging show. There's going to be a quick smokes show. That mm -hmm. might be something good. And I think the other was a Cuba Cuba was what it was. The other brand is a toast acid and Cuba Cuba. No, I love. Um, hold on. I'm sorry. Somebody was texting me. Um. But yeah, it's 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 a it's been a part of my life um, for a long time. I mean, I've cut back a lot. Um, I don't smoke nowhere near the way I used to, and mainly it's because I used to get cigars for free. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because um, when Cigar Factory owner, I mean Cigar Factory New Orleans had different ownership, um, they rolled their house their cigars in house, and so I would just walk in and get the second cigar. So they they would have cigars that they would throw in a box box for the employees that had yeah. defects and i would just walk in and grab a handful of the seconds and walk out and i wouldn't pay for them and so i mean i, I could walk in and get 20 cigars and walk out and don't worry about it you know and then they had a change in ownership and then the other owner and i didn't really see eye to eye um and so we came to agreement to respect each other and going about our business um and that was that so it was it was cool it was cool so now i smoke um i really gotta pay for them which is a whole different smoking habit when you you know that's kind of pricey you know spending oh, yeah. 50 60 dollars a day on cigars so it's like you're burning 20 bucks you might as well take 20 dollars and light it on fire um somebody asked a question i've seen a lot so paranormal but no cryptids for sure and i'm am i just not looking or not seeing um, the question would be, where are you living? Um, where do you live? I mean, are you in an environment where there are going to be cryptids around? And I don't necessarily know that that's a great, a bad thing that you're not seeing cryptids. You know what I'm saying? Like, it, to me, it's not necessarily a good thing that you do see them um, because the things that happen afterwards tend to not be, um, not be good at all. There's a shop in New Orleans where you watch them roll cigars. That's Cigar Factory in New Orleans where you watch them roll the cigars. That's the place I was talking about. Um, so it's not necessarily a bad thing that you, you're not seeing them. But it really depends on the environment that you find yourself in. Well, speaking of environments where 
it might be conducive to those things. Uh, here in Missouri, there's a place called Smittle Cave. Uh, years ago, when I was in high school, I was a member of a caving group that we would go to caves around the state and cave crawl and explore these caves. And I, I really enjoyed, you know, enjoyed doing it. Uh, but we actually got to meet the family that owned the land, the Smittle family that owned the land that this cave was on. Turns out it's listed as the fifth largest cave in the state of Missouri. Um, if you look at the Missouri Department of Conservation website today, uh, when you look up Smittle Cave on there, it basically says that the Smittle family donated the land because of endangered brown cave bats. That's not the case. I met the Smittle family and they were locked in a legal battle trying to prevent the Missouri, Missouri from taking their land, uh, it, claiming it was because of endangered brown cave bats. Um, well, after the Missouri Department of, Department of Conservation got the, got the land, now this cave entrance is large enough you could drive a truck into it. I mean, a good sized truck. Um, but there's, you know, it's it, the ground getting to the cave is extremely difficult to get to. Um, what they did to this cave uh, is really made me scratch my head because there's, well, I'll show you the picture. You, if they were simply trying to keep people out of the cave, there's much easier ways to do it. I'm going to bring up a picture and show you. Uh, and there's, if you look at the bottom of the picture, there's a person in that cave in, in the picture for scale to tell you what they did to the front of this cave. Uh, because I don't think this is for bats and the, the bars that they used were, easily four to five inches in diameter. Uh, this is something you couldn't pull off there with a bulldozer, I don't think. Let me, uh, let me show you the image. Got to hang on a second. There we go. This is the front of the cave now. You can what see the, the hell they worried about home. coming out of that cave? No kidding. They kicked the Smittle family off. They, they land had been in their, their family for a long time, like generations. Um, they took they seized the land, made it almost impossible to get back here to this cave, and that's what they put on there to, to seal off the entrance. Yeah, that's uh they worried about something coming. That ain't worried about no damn bat coming out of that cave. That's I mean, it would be higher if you I don't know what the hell they worried about coming out of that. Yeah. I've, I've been wondering about that for a long time. You can't get back in there. Uh, you can't even get into the cave without permission. And they only allow people to go into the cave for like a limited window, like once a year. Yeah, that's, um, I don't know about that one. That, that's weird. That That's extremely weird. It's actually kind of terrifying. There's another yeah. view of the cave. Nobody. I don't want nothing to do with that. And why is it? Why is there a lip on top of it like that? Like a little, almost like know. You, you know something's head may come up over that, but it can't get over it. But I mean, in my thoughts, if it's something something that's that big, then it should be able to jump over it. But I don't know. That's that's freaky, bro. That's really yeah, freaky. I've, I've been scratching my head about this one for a while. I'll tell you some of the things that eyewitnesses have described coming out of the earth. Mm -hmm. Are way more terrifying than um, Dog Man and Bigfoot. I mean, literally climbing out of the soil, like digging themselves out of the ground. 13 foot tall, emaciated looking men that run on their hands and their legs like an animal. Um, it's just terrifying things that people have encountered while they're on their search for cryptids. And it's um, that's why you won't find me going out looking for them because. I'm pretty sure, I'm 100% sure that there's way more wicked stuff out there than just a Bigfoot and a dog, man. I think they are like the base level regular dudes. You know what I'm saying? They're like, ah, uh, compared to the other guys, they're like, oh, yeah, you saw Bigfoot? Yeah, I saw Bigfoot. But there's stuff that makes them afraid that's out there that people are encountering. And I just don't want to encounter it. And mainly because at some point in time, like there's only so much context stretching that the human mind can take. Like your your brain's existing context of reality can only be stretched so much before it breaks and it snaps. And so I'm not looking to snap 
the reality of what I believe to be how the world exists. Um, I'm not intentionally trying to do that. And that's what happens to eyewitnesses. They literally snap the context of how their brain functions and sees reality. And once you realize that, for example, a dog man is real, you have to, it begs the next question is what else is real? And if there's movies about werewolves and there's movies about Bigfoot, then it means that everything else is real. And so that's the conundrum that people find themselves in once they go too deep. And I, I just, I'm not interested in it at all. I think once you've had an experience, be it cryptid or paranormal, I, I think it like flips a switch in your head because once your brain accepts that these things are real, you start noticing things you never noticed before. Mm -hmm. It's just like or, we talked about dismissed entirely. Just, just like you get a, you get a, a certain new vehicle and then all of a sudden that's all you see traveling down the road is that same vehicle. Yeah. You know, it's because your brain is, is now looking for that. Whereas before, before you I probably passed cop, it. Before I became a cop, I could drive through traffic and I didn't pay any attention to, to license plates. And now we're driving through town. I'll just point at the car and go, that tag's expired. That tag's expired. My wife's like, you're not even a cop anymore. Why are you still doing it? I'm like, I can't turn it off. We found, what, three or four uh, Saturday. Yeah, just driving <laughs> around. I mean, you're like, there, there, there. Yeah. <laughs> even though it was pointing them out. Yeah, it's, it's, just, it's, it's, it's just once you start noticing things like that, once you kind of change your way of thinking and you actively look for something, um, once you've seen it, once you've you know experienced it, I think you're going to start seeing more and more things. You might notice a sound that you ignored before. You might notice you know, the difference in tracks now. You might notice strange animal behavior when you ignored it before. I think I think once you've had that experience, once that switch is thrown, you know, you there's really no turning back. It, I think it's, at it's that like point, I told. You, it's like I told you my uh, the my tracker uh trainer that when i went through that class he said you'll never look at the ground the same way again and he's right because now that you're that i know what to look for things that i would have never it would have never occurred to me what it was before that i just walked by a million times and just never knew what it was now that i know what it is i look at oh that rock has been socketed out of the ground and look at you know there there's water in that track so that means it's you know, it's fairly fresh because the water hadn't absorbed into the track or dried out of it. Uh, oh, look at the, the break on the tree. It's the same color. Uh, so it's, it's fresh. All that stuff is just going through your mind that you never knew before. It's the same thing with this. You see something like this, like, well, you know, having, I've said it before, having my experience at eight years old, thankfully my brain was able to absorb it at that time. And it didn't, you know, that paradigm shift didn't do what it's done to, some people, like you said, you've talked to that never want to go in the woods again. It it certainly, you know, some people are affected so deeply. They, they don't ever want to see something like that again. Generally, you've got the two reactions. You've got idiots like me and Robbie that are like, oh, God, I got to know more. And then you've, you've got the people that are like, mm, nope, done. Nope, don't want to see it. Don't want to look at it. Don't want to hear about it. I'm out. And you know what you guys are talking about is called the reticular activating system. And that's what happens in the human mind. Um, once that context is stretched, it's, it's just like if you, I don't know, when I wanted my first Hummer, um, as soon as I started thinking about buying a Hummer, all I saw was Hummers everywhere, right? When I got rid of the Hummer, I would never see a Hummer anywhere. Um, and it's the reticular activating system. It's something that that's actually very positive if you know how to use it to create results it, it, it goes into the point where people try and say that humans create their own reality and in a sense it's kind of hacking reality if you intentionally do it but if it's out of control um it can it can lead to fear in manners in which it's just not manageable for the human mind and it physically affects your body for example um i don't know if you guys have known this or noticed this but if you look at every creator in the field, majority of people who came into this field as creators, they didn't have the level of gray hairs that they have since they've been in this field. They all grayed when they came into this field, right? Um, some of it is a stress from dealing with the BS that happens in the field, but there's other things that happens 
as your reality shifts and your context starts to shift and your understanding starts to shift, it takes a physical toll on your body. Um, and those are the things that people just freaking don't talk about, you know, and it happens to eyewitnesses as well. Um, so mm-hmm. you'll see eyewitnesses that had paranormal encounter, Bigfoot encounters. And when you first start talking to them, they look normal over time. They start to gray and you're like, man, your hair is turning real gray. What the hell is going on? Um, and it's just, it's the effect of being involved in this field. Um, it's, it's crazy once you really, really think about um, the effects of having involvement in this. It's absolutely insane. DWR areas that have big religious area more prone to supernatural. That's a great question. And um, if you will allow me, give me one second. I'm going to mute and close this door. If you allow me, I'll explain something that maybe you'll hear it somewhere else. When you start talking about supernatural paranormal activity um, and religious areas, what you are talking about is what would be battles of altars. So I remember growing up in New Orleans trying to figure out why there was always a church on the same corner as a liquor store or a nightclub. I I never understood it um, until I became older and I understood that um, the battle of altars. So a liquor store is technically an altar to where people go and buy liquor and this liquor is called spirits for a reason. And so it makes sense that you'll have a liquor store within walking distance of a church because the church is a, a place where the spirit of God is. This liquor store is where these other spirits hang to get people drunk and start murder and all the rest of this. And so you will see in, depending on how your reticular activating system works, you'll notice there's a church there. You'll notice there's other buildings and structures there. They tend to be the polar opposite. And you'll see a lot of paranormal supernatural activity in that area. <clears throat> the essence of spiritual warfare is that um, it's a battle of altars. And so, yes, the answer is yes, you will find that going on in those areas. But the truth of the matter is it's a battle of altars <clears throat> and, and it's deep. Most people don't understand, but an altar can be a building, it can be a place, it can be invisible, it can be anything. Um, it's just a place where something is habitually um, done. Like I'll give you guys an example. I didn't learn until years later that that same place, the foundation room at the House of Blues, they, they when Live Nation took it over, they completely renovated and got rid of everything. I didn't learn until years later that that was technically an altar, but it was a private club. But when you went there and you're drunk and you spent your money and did all this stuff in this room with this Buddha statue, that it was an altar to Buddha. I found out from the actual manager um, who managed the place. And he was like, yeah, man, you know, you know, that Buddha make us a lot of money. I'm like, what the hell you mean Buddha make you a lot of money? He's like, make us a whole lot of money, man. People come in there and they, they spend all their money. It's like, wow, that's crazy. And so, yes, the answer to your question is yes, you will find that. Um, DW, have you ever heard about U.S. Customs document of vampires coming in through Florida? I have not heard about that. And I would love to figure out where to read about that at because um, it would make sense because people are coming from Haiti straight to Florida. Yeah, that would make a lot of sense. So how did you first become aware of, well, what was this, what did you call it, what it is, the vampires? Uh, how did you be, first become aware of them operating in New Orleans? You've always, I've always heard about them um, in New Orleans. I just never took it serious. Um, I didn't really take it serious until I became a member of what you would call the paranormal media in the field of paranormal and started investigating and actually going into the French quarters, wanting to ask questions about it. But the very, very first time I heard about one, we were having this party on Bourbon Street across from, holy crap, I forgot the name of this bar room, but it's a bar room where there's known to have sightings. But anyway, my friends owned a condo on top of the post office. Uh, I'm going to tell you. I'm just going to look it up because I don't want to lie to you. Post office 
on Bourbon Street. It might not even be a post. It was like a a posted store. <sighs> but anyway, my friends own the um, French Quarter Postal Emporium. That's it. Uh, yeah, that's it. The French Quarter Postal Emporium. On top of there, if you were to look at the pictures, upstairs, there's a balcony. And um, some of my very close friends, they owned that condo up there. So we would have the wildest parties you could ever imagine. So, like, imagine going into a courtyard on the French quarters because, you know, everything's behind walls. Courtyard, we'd have a crawfish boil. You go up the steps into the condo. There's a stripper pole in there. I mean, it's a one-bedroom condo. I mean, just the wildest, craziest parties you will ever imagine would happen in there. And um, <laughs> I was outside on a balcony with my partner, Aaron, and we're smoking. Aaron smoked these it's super duper European, expensive European cigarettes at this point in time. I'm smoking a cigar and we're just talking, da 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 da. da. And, and he was like, you know, um, he's like, you know, they got vampires over there, right? I'm like, what do you mean, vampires? He's like, yeah, at the ballroom right there, there's, there's freaking vampires. Um, he used to own uh, Sabiza's Cafe, which was one of the most haunted cafes in the French quarters. They owned it for a year, and they had to shut it down because of the paranormal activity. And so he's like, yeah, you know, they got vampires over there, blah, 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 blah. And we're just talking like, man, vampires. And he's like, I'm telling you, let's go down there. We'll go talk to the bartender. So we go downstairs, walk across the street, walk to the crowd. And he walks in. He's like, Aaron, what's going on, man? Everybody's all excited to see him. Hey, my buddy wants to know about the vampires. And the guy looks. And he says, well, why do you want to know about that? I said, well, I got a YouTube channel. And he just starts breaking it down. He's talking about sanguine, blood-drinking vampires. He's talking about psychic vampires. He's talking about how you can tell when a person's a vampire. He talks about the hats that they wear. He talks about the way they move. It's like they glide instead of walking. And he's like, I've served hundreds of them here. They come here. And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> like, what the hell? And um, it, it was amazing that have conversations with a person who talked to a real vampire. And it didn't freak him out at all. I mean, I was like, bro, I couldn't work in an environment. Like, he's like, nah, they cool with me. But um, if you are unsuspecting tourists, you might have a problem on your hands. So it all stemmed from me really going into the field. But growing up in New Orleans, you find out about a lot of crazy things. You learn about vampires, hellhounds, um, people Rougarous. who use rougarous, which we call dog, man. But they're down every and here in New Orleans, we call it rougarous. Um, some of the most got, crazy. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just I got family down uh, around Slidell and uh, places like that, and that, that's I've heard plenty of stories about those. I'll tell you some of the craziest stories come from the hood, right? Um, in New Orleans, magic is used because people want power, right? And that's all that magic boils down to. Um, bloodline vampires versus people acting as vampires. I'll touch on that in the second grade. Um, in New Orleans, people want power, and so they, they, they use magic to make their lives better and, and get control of things. Some women use it to get control of their husbands. Some people use it to get promotions in business. They have charms. They have all... I've been in business meetings with men, and I didn't know about it at that point in time because I wasn't really paying attention but I've been at negotiation tables where men were holding charms in their hand. I was like, why is this dude holding this thing in his hand? Not really understanding what was going on. But nonetheless, um, some of the most crazy stories come from the fact that people are household magic practitioners. Like uh, if you take, for example, this happened in 98, maybe 99, it might, might have been 99. Um, there's a Zulu club that has a picnic. Zulu is a Zulu social aid and pleasure club. Well, back in those days, um, a close friend of mine, he, he got murdered uh, maybe two years ago, a year and a half ago. Yeah, that was last year that Hayward got. Yeah. Anyway, um, he's significant older than me, and we would go hang out at these at the Zulu functions. And we're hanging out talking. And he's like, say, bro, uh, homeboy, old lady called him cheating. And so we just talking about this guy's old lady catching and finding out that he's cheating. 
And the whole story was she was going to come to the event and she was going to make this big fuss in this big scene. So everybody was worried about her coming, making this scene. Well, she shows up with this potato salad, like a big old, you know, I have those big silver tin uh, containers. She shows up with this big old silver tin container of potato salad. But then she has a smaller one and she walks up there. She puts the big one on the table and then hands him the smaller one and just sits down and acts like nothing ever happened. And so I'm sitting there with Wood and my partner X and we're just talking. And Hayward says, man, I hope this dude don't, he used the N-word. He said, man, I hope this dude don't use eat this potato salad. This going in bad. I'm like, man, what you talking about? He's like, bro, you ain't noticed that she gave everybody one potato salad, but she got a small thing of potato salad for him. I'm like, man, I ain't paying no attention to that. We talking to chicks, moving around, da 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 She sits there while he eats the potato salad. Eats it. As soon as he gets through eating, she just leaves. Goes on about her business. A couple of hours pass. And he falls on the ground and is just writhing in pain. Like just, just ugh, like he's trying to vomit, writhing in pain. They got to call the ambulance to come get him. Ambulance comes to get him. The back of the ambulance, he starts vomiting. And they start pulling this mucus out of his stomach. And we're watching them pull this out of his, out of his mouth. And it's like a string of mucus and they keep pulling and keep pulling and keep pulling and keep pulling to the point to where they're looking like okay what the hell is this and so they finally take him down to charity hospital um that's what i what i witnessed myself later on the stories came out that they pulled two paint buckets of this yellowish green mucus out of his stomach oh, before crap. he got better and it was all because he ate this damn potato salad and so when you start talking about new orleans man you really talking about crazy crap that goes down in in my city man like it's, it's insane stuff and most people think you know people in new orleans are so nice and they're so da 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 well people in new orleans are nice because everybody has an understanding that there's two things that are prevalent in new orleans there's murder and there's magic both of them are very prevalent so you meet people in New Orleans, they're cool and laid back because you never know who you're messing with and never know who you're talking to. That same little old lady who was trying to come home from the grocery store with her groceries that your son robbed might be somebody who will put something on you that'll hurt you for the rest of your life. And that's how New Orleans is, man. Mark Napier had a question for you. He says, do vampires run New Orleans government and the police? No. But they do run politics as to who would be elected. Um, like, so you're not going to see a vampire be a police officer like in some kind of movie, but they have a lot of influence and a lot of money and a lot of power. So they dictate the direction of the city in certain situations. It's New Orleans is factions, and they're a part of the factions that are in New Orleans. Um, I don't... Over over the past since Hurricane Katrina, the influence level of everybody that's a power player in New Orleans has waned because of the new New Orleans that's there and the new blood that's come to New Orleans, which are not the traditional New Orleanians. So everybody's influence has waned. Um, as a political consultant, my influence has waned because there's you know this it's just not what it used to be. Like New Orleans used to be, if you wanted to get somebody elected, you'll pay for the buses, you'll bus people from the project to the polls, and you'll get somebody elected. Well, it's it's just not that way anymore because the the city is not set up the way it used to be. So, um, do they have influence? Yes. Do they have power? Yes. Um, but if you want to see them, you really do. Get all you have to do is get a ticket to the Comus Mardi Gras Ball. When you go in there, you'll notice there's people there that just they ain't right, and that's them. Um, do you think the bloodlines? What do you think of bloodline vampires versus people acting as vampires? Um, I think that the people who pretend to be vampires have a mental, they have mental illness. Um, something's mentally wrong with them. Um, period. If that's what you're talking about, Greg, I think there's they suffer from mental illness. Um, I think the people who you would say are bloodline vampires, they are what they are, and they've been around for a long time, and their bloodlines have been around for a long time. 
And I've said this. I forgot where I was. Maybe I was on my show and I was talking about the non-human humans that you encounter. Um, they look like humans, but they're not humans. And if you understand, if there's one thing you should understand as a person who's a listener to the paranormal and an interest in the supernatural is most people find themselves worrying about giants and Bigfoots and monsters. It's the non-human humans that have the ability to influence political systems and everything else that is what you should be concerned about. Someone was talking about reptilians earlier, right? Um, it's people who look like they're human that are not humans that should be your major concern because that's what you're facing when you talk about the Illuminati and the people who run the world and the people who want to have new world government, they're just, they look like humans, but they're not humans. And that's the honest to God truth. It's so, <clears throat> kind of like that movie that, um, I was his Brandon Routh was in where he was the, he was in new Orleans and he was a paranormal investigator. Used to be a police officer and, there were werewolves and vampires and zombies and all that stuff in there. And it was kind of like, you know, some people just knew it and accepted it. And other people had no clue, but they like pretty much ran the city. Kind of like what you were talking about. It's just like that thing we've talked about. All these movies that you see that seem so fantastical and far out there. A lot of times we find out that these movies aren't really far off the, off the mark. No, they're not off the mark at all. In fact, all those movies are based on reality. It's just that it's a spinoff of the reality that you're, you're seeing. So when you see a Jurassic Park that comes out, and they're talking about a freaking island where they've been DNA splicing and bringing back dinosaurs, and then you go read the news, and you see that they've been doing it in China. Man, it's, it's based on the reality of what's taking place. It's just they're putting it in entertainment form. Mm -hmm. um, somebody says, D.W. could Katrina have been a break... To, been to break that control of the area. No. Um, I'll tell you this. I know this to be a fact about Katrina. Um, three years before Katrina hit, I was sitting in the house that's owned by Jay-Z and Beyonce right now. It's on Harmony Street, um, right off St. Charles. And the owner was my mentor. And so we're sitting there and he's talking about the future of New Orleans. And he pulls out this map and he says, um, he says, man, you're a pretty good investor, but you need to know, you don't know what's really going on in this city. I said, oh, okay, well, tell me what's really going on. He says, well, the next time we have a major hurricane, this is what's going to happen to New Orleans. We're going to tear down all the projects. We're going to displace people from the property that's uh, where the projects are, are the, uh, the best property in the city. We're going to move them towards New Orleans East and move them towards Slidell. We're going to try and move the Superdome next to the French quarters because it'd be a better location for the Superdome to be next to the French quarters. But I don't know if we're going to be able to get rid of the cemetery that's there. That's going to be a big deal. Um, but we're going to try and move it to where the old projects were over there. And he's explaining all these things that they're going to do way before we knew there was going to be a Katrina. So I'm like, this is crazy. Like, this is insane. I'm like, man, you bugging. Like, there's no way that this is going to happen. He's like, James, I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen. Lo and behold, here comes Katrina. War, bam. Knocks everything out. Somebody blows the levees, which that is true. The city floods. Bada bing, bada boom. Fast forward. You have a new New Orleans. They couldn't put everything in place that they wanted to put in place because there were people who were fighting for the city, the culture of the city, to remain the same. Um, and, but they did get a lot of things accomplished that they wanted to get accomplished. It's a new, new Orleans. And back after Katrina, there was a plan that was floating around that you could read called the new, new Orleans plan. So, um, I would say that they're very powerful people who have plans for areas, but they know based on, you know, hundred year flood maps, they know based on, uh, astrological signs and events. They know what's going to happen based on what's happened in the past. And so they take advantage of those things and do what they can do to profit off of. Making long-term plans. Yes. 
very long term plans. Very, very Roxanne long-term Delgado plans. said, Could some of the old bloodlines be vampires? I'm pretty sure some of the old bloodlines are vampires, some of them are reptilians, some of them are what you would call aliens. I mean, yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. In the Bible, it talks about the, the Israelites fighting tribes that would drink blood. Um, I mean, they were blood drinking tribes. I mean, it, it's the funniest thing is if you read the Bible, you really read it and study it. There's a lot there that if you will glance over it, um, if you're not paying close attention. I mean, it's a lot there that that you can truly understand as to how the world is the way it is now. For example, um, you showed me a picture of a cave, right? Um, mm-hmm. If you talk about one of the things that's a part of the testimony of Jesus Christ, that he died, he arose with all authority of everything above the earth, below the earth, and inside of the earth. Why do you need authority of things inside of the earth unless there's something inside of the dang on earth? <laughs> you yep. know what I'm saying? So um, it's those things that when you really study and then you look at this field and then you go back to the Bible and you really, really study, it's like, holy crap, there's a lot of validation um, that you find from being a person in this field. Uh, and that's what that's why, you know, I've become a stronger Christian since I've been in this field. I mean, way stronger than I was when I started, because you 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 clearly see everything playing out right in front of you. And the more witnesses you talk to, and you start hearing about Jen, and you start hearing about shadows with red eyes, and it's like, what the hell? You talk people astral projecting into people dreams, and I, it's just like, wait, what? Somebody did what to you? And you, you when you're trying to find answers for a person, um, as opposed to just hearing a story, um, you have to research, and you have to, you know, it, it's hard to talk to eyewitnesses the way I do, and not be able to present some type of solution to them. Because people want to tell you the story, but they they really want a solution to their problems. They really do. Uh, Martin Rapier wanted to know if you know anything about black-eyed children. Um, yeah, I mean, I've had quite a few black-eyed kid stories um, in the past. I'm still not sure what they are, but I, I call them non-human humans is the category I put them in. They look like humans, but they're not humans. Um, the one person I know that let them inside of their house ended up, their foot ended up rotting off, rotting off, and they had to have their part of their um, the lower leg amputated because it touched one of them, touched them on their leg. Um, other than that, I don't know much. I mean, there's, there's not really truly much information out there other than their kids that look like humans. Um, now, I've seen black-eyed people um myself and i just believe those people are demonically energized people um that's pretty spooky to see a person's eyes go black and i think there's a difference between a person with black eyes and just a black eyed kid um i think the black eyed kids are like non-human human children whatever the hell they're here for they're doing it and i just think those people whose eyes turn black are just demon infested people That to me that makes sense. I mean, you anytime you're seeing something with completely black eyes, there's no humanity there. There's something far far too dark uh, for us to really even you know want to mess with it. I stuff like that scares me more than any any cryptid or any criminal uh, because I, you know how do you fight that? Uh, you know other than you know than prayer and faith, but you know if. if well, if there's you a reason run they across something like that. You can't stop it on your own. There's a reason they say the eyes are the windows, windows to the soul. And when mm-hmm. you take, when you, when the eyes are completely black like that, that pretty much means the soul is gone, in, in my estimation, or taken over. Maybe is better is a better corrupted. Yeah. Yeah, I I believe you're 100 percent correct. Um, I. The people I've talked to that have went through the process, well, let me start here and say this. So um, there's a guy named Kenneth Deal. Um, well, Kenneth died. But Kenneth Deal was the first demonologist that I talked to um, because back when I was living on Robert Street, I was having 
crazy, crazy stuff, terrifying stuff. And so he and I started having conversations and he actually started teaching me um, the corruption of the human soul. And I didn't know that a human soul could be corrupted. But the way he described it to me was like, imagine your soul being a jar of light in the center of your body. And um, he said, imagine a demonic entity being like an octopus, very intelligent octopus. You put an octopus in a, in a jar, it'll screw the lid off the jar and it'll find its way out, right? And he's like, so imagine having something or one thing or 10 things that are constantly unscrewing the lid to that jar that your soul is in and just sliding themselves into that, that light, but they're pitch black. And over time, the more and more of them get in there, um, you start to change. And then there's people who turn themselves over to those things. Um, they make agreements and they turn themselves over and they come become perfectly possessed by those entities. And so those are the people whose eyes will turn black and you will end up talking to the entity as opposed to the person. Uh, I tell you the fun, the night is, I, I, when I say the funny thing, I, as just a, a new Orleans thing that we do, it's nothing funny about it. I need to stop saying that, but the most peculiar thing is you'll see that play out in this field. Um, where you can see creators come into the field and I've seen enough of them come in. And there's these levels of influence that they go through and you can see the corruption that hits them at different levels. So um, you'll see somebody at at the early stages, you know, 500 to 1500 to 2000 subscribers that come into the field, they're trying to get attention. Uh, they're attacking everybody. They're going crazy. They're a small channel, but they're, they're just fighting everybody, fighting everybody, fighting everybody because they want that influence and they want that attention, not knowing that that process that you're going through is a process that's corrupting you. Um, and then they get a little bit bigger and then they go through the next cycle and then they get bigger and they go through the next cycle. And as they go through these cycles, they are corrupted as an individual um, because it's, it's kind of like you go through, they go through pride where they, it's all about them. They go through, it's just these cycles. It's kind of hard to articulate because I see it. Um, and at some point in time, that person that started is no longer the person. The person now is not the person that started. And when it becomes visible for people to see, it's kind of too late. It really, really is. Um, like when people talk to me about, hey, man, you know, I want to start my YouTube channel. And it is not necessarily just it doesn't just hinge on the paranormal itself. It's something about the human condition of the human soul in the human mind, I guess, I guess you can just say humanity or the heart of men, um, that attention from other people um, starts to corrupt them if they're not careful. And I've seen it not just in the paranormal field. I've seen it in the martial arts field where I coach people on their martial arts channels. I've seen it um, in the video gaming field where I advise people on their video gaming channels. It's just it's something about human nature that makes it extremely dangerous. Uh, and you need God to, to have to garner influence because there's so many other things that come at you um, to wreck you. It, it really does. Like I, there's been people who've been in this field that quit because they couldn't handle reading comments and comments would send them into depression. Mm -hmm. I mean, just comments. And I'm like, man, I'm quitting. Why? Because I can't take the comments. I'm like, are you crazy? They just, you don't know, people don't know you. Well, yeah, but they said this about me. I'm like, but they don't know you. They don't know nothing about you. Like, they never met you. They never spent an hour with you. How are you going to let a comment get under your skin like that? But, right. I mean, it's just, it's just different, you know? I feel like I'm rambling, but I think I'm making sense. I'm trying to get the point across. You make it perfect. I, I, yeah, it makes perfect sense to me. Somebody said it in the, in the chat a minute ago. You're very well spoken, and you do have a way of getting your point across where just about everybody can understand it. I was reading that comment and I was like, that's a hundred percent accurate. Well, thank you. Whoever said that you're greatly appreciated. I appreciate the compliment, but I mean, it's just the truth. Um, well, that's, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, it, and you can, you kind of hit on this and I've said this before, you know, people talk about 
dinosaurs and dinosaurs this and dinosaurs that. And, you know, and they say that humans and dinosaurs never existed together and blah, blah, blah. But how many times do they use the word dragon in the Bible? A whole lot. Over a hundred times. And the word dinosaur was not made until the 1800s. It was like, dragon. <laughs> it was dragon. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you had no other word and you saw you walking around and you saw a, a T-Rex, I'd probably call it a dragon. Yeah. So is and you said if you just if you just start drawing those parallels, there's a lot of stuff that gets answered in that book. And oh man, it's all kind of stuff get answered if you really if you really study the Bible led by the Spirit of God, it, it it's like it it unlocks things that a person who just reads it, for example, a person can pick up a Bible and just read it and start in Genesis in the beginning, you know, there was God and God made the, the heavens and the earth and blah, 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 blah. You just read it, but there's no revelation with it. When there's revelation with it, the first sentence makes all the sense. In the beginning was God. And it tells you, okay, if in the beginning was God, and then he made all these different things and all of them are still working right now to this day perfectly. Um, then if you want something in your life to work perfectly, then you need to have God in the beginning because it just tells you in the beginning, God, okay, it makes sense to me. Well, if I want my channel to blow up, if I want my family to be great, if I want my kids to be fantastic, I need to start with God because he makes things that work. And, but you don't get to that if you're not, if you don't have the spirit of God teaching you and revealing things to you, you just read in the beginning was God. And then he made the heavens and earth. And then on this day, he said, let there be light. And on this day, he said this. But if you actually had a spirit of God with you, then you understand that, no, he put a portion of his power in light. He put a portion of his power in, in the sun, the moon, the stars. And so all those things end up having their own power, which is why people did sun worship, because the sun is actually powerful. And why people did moon worship and why people did star worship and all these different things. But it's a matter of, having a spirit of revelation teaching you what's going on and um the unique thing about being in this field and it's truly the unique thing about it i tell people this all the time you have a phenomenal opportunity to get to the real truth because you're facing things that most people won't face so for example in your chat i'm pretty sure there's at least I don't know, let's say it's 100 people. I don't know how many because I'm not really looking. But if there's 100 people, at least 10% of the people in this chat have experienced sleep paralysis, period. Hands down, they've experienced it. And those people who experience sleep paralysis know that to get rid of it, you rebuke it in the name of Jesus, right? So if that works, then what else works? It's, it's a unique opportunity for people in this field, listeners in this field, creators in this field, to get to a level of truth and accelerate in levels of understanding that the average individual will never have because they just they just don't see it the way you see it. I've had people who will say, well, DW, you know, I try and talk to my family members and my friends about this crazy weird stuff. And, you know, they just don't get it. And I tell them, look, you don't you're missing the point. They're not supposed to be the one to get it. You're the one who gets it. And you're the one supposed to learn for your entire family because you're the one going through it. So you were the chosen one to actually follow the path um, to get the level of understanding that can change your bloodline forever. But you're taking it the wrong way and you're not going down the wrong road. You're going down the road of fear or some other road, but it's a unique situation to be in, a very unique situation because you can't know how bright the light is unless you've seen how dark the darkness is. That's a, absolutely true. It's like you can't you can't appreciate the good things that you have sometimes without knowing how bad the bad times were for you. If everything's always good, then you're never going to appreciate how those things are for you unless you've gone through the bad times. Yeah, I mean, on a base level is that, but on a on another level, it's truly experiencing darkness. Like this field, you in this field, you truly going to experience 
darkness because it's a dark field. I mean, uh, it's kind of like a hospital, right? You know, rich people, poor people, um, migrants, everybody. It's one place that everybody got, is going to meet in common. is a hospital, right? You, you can go in there. You're going to find the wealthiest man in the hospital, the poorest man in the hospital. You're going to find a preacher in the hospital. You can find a, a devil worshiper in the hospital, right? This is one of those unique environments where you're going to find everybody and a little bit of everything. And anytime you find yourself in one of those environments, it's an opportunity to grow. I think, um, I think we've, we've all been up against that darkness. And, um, I, uh, I think, honestly, I think that's what put me in the hospital. Well, we already know what put you in the hospital. <laughs> you know that. Yeah. Um, but even, even that, I'll tell you this. It's an op everything is an opportunity for you to grow. Like it really, truly is an opportunity for you to grow as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a friend. Um, God has a way of no matter what it is for turning it for your good. And I can honestly say that because I've experienced it over and over and over again. And so things that seem like a tax, if you just sit back and wait and chill and don't panic and have faith, you'll find out the 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 not just a silver lining, but you'll find a golden parachute in the middle of it. But it's a matter of just being patient, chilling, not spazzing out, not tripping, and then learning to look, and then you're gonna see it. Um, somebody asked about any stories from the Appalachian trails. I have some of the worst dog men encounters from the Appalachian mountains. I'm not going to tell them because they're coming out in the book. The most bloody gruesomest dog man encounters there is. One of the stories that about dog man that came from the Appalachians and I'll tell you this one because it's been released. There was a guy out there that was, let's just say he wasn't doing right by kids. He had a bad habit of doing things to kids that he shouldn't do. And this was one of the stories where I realized that there was a true supernatural aspect to Dogman. That kid's grandmother did something. To this day, I haven't figured out exactly what she did, but that man was attacked by a Dogman. And it was witnessed by multiple people that he was attacked by a Dogman. But it was, she did it. I still ain't figured out what she did. She admitted doing it. But uh, yeah, he he got mollywhopped by a dog man over that kid, and so um, the Appalachians is a is a is a terrifying place to me. You're talking about like uh, granny magic that happens in the Appalachians. You got all kind of crazy stuff out there in the Appalachians that feral people. Um, that's just insane. Feral people. Um, Feral people hunting humans. They have something. Pe uh, lots of people going missing. They have something similar to that down in Louisiana, don't they? I've heard uh, stories of what they refer to as the night people coming out of the swamps. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Come out of swamps and getting people. It's are uh, they feral people or are they just people that that uh, have dedicated themselves to I hunting just, long pigs, so I to just, speak? I just think they're evil, wicked people that live in the swamps that hunt long pigs. I mean, I just think that's what it is. I don't think it's nothing like supernatural to it. I just think they're just wicked people. I mean, there's places in the swamps in Louisiana that um, that you have to go out of your way to get to. I mean, you you got to go out of your way to get there. I mean, you got to go you got to go into the swamps, drag a boat overland into a lake, go across the lake, drag it over, drag it overland to another lake or a bayou, and it's just places that are untouched. You know. Um, that most people can't get access to. And it's those people who try and venture into those places that run into huge, huge problems. Huge problems. Like, like what kind of problems? Giants, swamp giants, dog men, Bigfoot, alligators that don't make no sense. Like I'll tell you a story that's in one of the books that completely messed me up. Um, the Duranzale family down in Louisiana, um, they're all through the swamps. And I end up talking to, at a crawfish ball, I end up talking to one of the Duranzales. And 
at first he's like making fun of me being uh, uh in the paranormal field. He's like, ah, oh, you into that paranormal crap, da 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 da. And I always found that when people make fun of it, they're hiding something. So he, I mean, he's being offensive. I mean, cursing and all the rest of this. And I'm sitting there chilling, trying to get under my skin. And he does it for about 10, 15 minutes. People looking at me because they know normally I'm quick to check somebody. But I'm sitting there saying to myself, I'm looking at this man and he knows something. And so he goes off and I finally say in front of everybody, I say, you know, you 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 talking real brolic like to say that you saw something in the swamps that scared you. You want to tell us what scared you? And he just gets quiet. I said, uh-huh, I got you, huh? I don't want to talk about it. So we'll talk about it in private. End up catching him right outside the bathroom in the hallway. I said, man, what you saw that's got you acting this way? And he goes on to tell me about um, him crossing over. He goes into the bayou, goes into a uh, goes into the bayou, drags his boat across land into this lake, and he's having some of the best fishing he's ever had. And he was like, man, I'm going to keep going further to see what else I can find. And when he goes to take his boat, and it's one of those flat boats, and he goes to drag it onto this next body of land, the land starts to move. And he's thinking that it's a, a, a sinkhole, like it's going to sink into the swamps. Um, he's like, man, you know, I, I thought it was a sinkhole. I thought I was about to die. I was just going to sink. But he said it wasn't sinking. It was moving. He's like, so now I, I got my boat halfway across. And he said, I'm trying to yank it and pull it back. But it's moving like it's moving under my feet. And finally, he gets his boat to the water. But he's still on land. And it's moving fast enough to where his boat drifts away. And so he's sitting there watching the boat there and him moving. He has to dive into this body, into this body of water and swim to the boat. And he watches that land move. And now... This is the thing that got me. He says that from a distance, it looked like a giant shoulder was on one side of the land coming out of the water. And I was like, bruh, hold up. I'm like, how many beers you done had? So now I'm doing like a, a drink check. Like, man, how many beers you done had? And like, you you drunk, man. You you tripping. I mean, you you tripped out. He's like, nah, I'm, I'm telling you, this happened. D this happened. And when I'm looking in his eyes... I'm seeing the fear in his eyes. Like there's, you guys have been in law enforcement. You know what fear looks like, right? Like this is real fear. This man is afraid as he's telling me the story. And, I was, and so my only question was, well, will you ever go back? He said, man, I won't go nowhere near there. He said, you couldn't pay me $10 million to go nowhere near there. That was something the size of the land that was moving. He said, that's how big it was. And I'm like, man, that, that's crazy. That that that's some crazy crap. But there used to be giants that they called cloud eaters that were so big that they stood up, that their heads was in the clouds. The Native Americans in Louisiana talked about them all the time. So it makes sense that they're still around somewhere. And I'm that yeah. that, that that's some terrifying stuff, bro. That's terrifying. Yeah, it is. Well, what some of those uh, giant skeletons that miraculously got lost, wasn't some of them up to like 36 feet? Yep. Yeah, I tall? think some of them were well over 30 feet tall. Mm hmm So, um, it's, uh, it's crazy. I mean, when I, the more I've dug into this, like right now I'm, I'm getting ready to start a process of doing experimentation. It's group evidence gathering on giants and the relations to locations where they found giant skulls and known active Bigfoot and Dogman territory. I just came up with the idea. I said, okay, we got Google News where you can go to Google News and you can type in giant skull, giant skeleton, giant this, and it's going to pull up old newspaper articles of like 1920s, 1910. I was like, okay, let's see what they thought a giant was. Let's see if the giants that they were finding are actually Bigfoots or they're humans or what they are. And as soon as I started reading, I'm like, holy crap, this is insane. They're calling them giant red men. They're calling them all kinds of stuff. Um, they're describing skulls that look like monkey skulls. 
but they're calling them humanoid as opposed to humans. And I'm like, well, I mean, if you saw Bigfoot, you would call it a humanoid instead of a human. And um, it's just so much to really dig into now that we have access to the internet. I mean, it's just so much you can dig into. I mean, you can dig into anything and you can find the truth about anything. So um, I'll be keeping a running spreadsheet that anybody can access as I update it. Um, I just created the spreadsheet yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday evening I created the spreadsheet and I'm going to be keeping track of all the articles that I find in the counties. And then I'm going back and try and find it would be nice if other people would find Bigfoot encounters like from BFRO and all the rest of that stuff and see if it correlates to the direct area with the same counties, the same everything. I feel like I'm going to have to do it all myself, but I'll do a sample 50 to 100 just to see um, a small enough sample that will make sense. Um, where you can make correlations and then if somebody else wants to pick up on it they can pick up on it and go with it from there but i'll tell you if you go into google news and look up the old newspapers and start typing in werewolf and bigfoot and giant skeletons a whole bunch of stuff comes up it's ridiculous the werewolf some of the gonna... older ones that don't mention bigfoot then we referred to him as a hairy man or a wild man you can get a lot of really interesting results doing wild man Yep. I didn't even think about wow, man. I didn't think about that. Um, but yeah. So to me, um, you know, there's always people who say there's no evidence that these things existed, right? Well, I mean, if we find it in the newspaper, wouldn't that be evidence, right? They're talking about it in the news. So um, it's, it's ample evidence out there. That's all I'll say. It's just a matter of who wants to go looking for it. Yeah. You know, the, the one of the things we've noticed is, you know, no matter what evidence you find, there are going to be some people that will just refuse to believe it. You could walk up and present them with the smoking gun and they'll call it a fake or a hoax or you know, there's some people who will never believe. Um, and you there's just there's just no way around that but then there are other people that you know you don't have to provide a body for them to believe bigfoot exists uh you don't have to you know provide proof of of dog man for them to accept that it's out there uh so you've got people on both sides of the fence there but it's it's the the the, the refuse to believe is the people that keep want to keep their head buried in the sand that will never convince and there's gonna be other things that happen that convince them uh trust me <laughs> There's other stuff coming down the pipeline that will convince them with no problem. They will be convinced. They ain't you know getting around some of this other stuff that's coming down the pipeline. If they think um if they haven't accepted the reality of what's there now, there's things that's coming that I'm sorry, you you're gonna have to accept. And it's clear, it's right there on a it's on a horizon. So they, there's things they're gonna have to accept. We just had people try and mass murder a whole freaking part of the population so you you gonna you're gonna see some things you're gonna see some things i think uh with everything that's going on in the world i think i think something is big moving behind the scenes that's going to shake a lot of people when it when it happens yes yeah, we've, we've talked about that for a while now that we we think that too many too many pieces are in play the you know pieces that shouldn't be in play but are moving anyway Which that brings up another uh, a point. Johnny sent me a link to a TikTok that something that was just put out. This woman has got, and this just came, her she just put this video out. She's got the maps that we did. Well, when would, did we do that the first time? Was that about a year ago that we started talking mm -hmm. about the overlays of the mm -hmm. caves and the four one one and the Bigfoot sightings? She's mm -hmm. overlay. She's overlaying them. Like like I, this video was just put out like a day or two ago. She's got the map, the four one one, and the cave system overlays. Only thing she different is she didn't have the Bigfoot sightings that we had in there. Yeah, we've been talking about that for well over a year. She might not be around too long. Y'all might want to keep an eye on her. She'll be one of them people that have a car accident. <laughs> so I'm gonna tell you, yeah. she'd be one of them people that have a car accident because she decided to drive herself off the side of a cliff. Mm -hmm. Then they found in the trunk of her car stuffed in a black duffel bag and, you know, she committed suicide. That's unfortunately, that's what happens when people hit on the truth. 
And it, the beauty of it is if you just do the research, it's all right there. Overlaying oh, maps, yeah. it's literally right there. I mean, it's like I said a long time ago, I don't really go into the missing 411 because I feel like that gentleman's done great research and I don't think there's any need to piggyback on it. But I said I would be very interested in knowing the backgrounds of each and every person that was a missing 411. Like, what was their situation in life before they went into those woods? Well, uh, one and of I the things that, that he, he did point out was a great deal of them uh, were either handicapped or in some sort of diminished capacity. A lot of people had had some form of autism that went disapp that disappeared. Makes sense. Makes sense. And those are the things that I would look for just to see. I mean, I would really, and I might need to go take a look at it, really dig into it. And compare it to what um what the other correlations he had to the ones that I found. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I found that when it comes to men in their research, um, people take it very personally. I don't take my research personally. That's why I was like, look, anybody can use it. I don't care. I'll share it with you. But people take it very personally. And I understand because in many cases, it's a life's work to come up with that information. So mm -hmm. um, I figure there's enough info out there for everybody to find something new. I agree. Uh, speaking of something something new, though, we've talked about stories. We've talked about you know different different things in New Orleans. One of the things we didn't haven't touched on is the fact that you're a published author. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about your books and where people can find them? Yeah, you can go on Amazon, and I have uh, I'm not mistaken, I have five books out there: Siege of Lock and Ranch, um, uh, Shocking Bigfoot Encounters, Volume One and Volume Two. Uh, the the being an author for me is a new thing, um, especially writing about this. Um, so I've been working out the kinks um, to get it done, but I'm excited about it. Now I've, I've hit the stride where now I got a better understanding of it. Um, shocking Bigfoot encounters in the desolate places will be the next one. Um, and then paranormal stories. Um, not to listen to in the dark will be the next one. Those are actually both done. I've just been working on YouTube more than anything to put them out there. The, the, the Bigfoot encounters in desolate places is one that I would say when it drops, you should buy it and listen to it. I mean, read it. And I'm going to do the audio version of it because those are Bigfoot encounters where eyewitnesses are um, encountering Bigfoots while encountering water spirits, um, encountering Bigfoots where they're manifesting in the backseat of their cars. Um, one lady had a Bigfoot, uh, a baby Bigfoot in her closet, which didn't make any damn sense. There's another one where it was literally the son saw a Bigfoot in the backyard, um, thought it was his dad in a rainstorm and was like, come inside, come inside. He invites what he saw outside inside the house, realizes that it's his dad in the house with him. His dad's like, son, close that door. And they go through this time period, this tumultuous time period where Something opens their back door, runs through their house, opens their front door and runs out of their front door and then loops around their house, running um, in and out of their house, back through the back door, through the front door, back around the house, through the back door, through the front door. And they're seeing these giant freaking footprints uh, across the carpet, across the, uh, the tile floor at the front door to the point to where they just leave the freaking house. I mean, just like, we, we don't understand what's going on, but I mean, it would be described as a Bigfoot footprint. And so mm -hmm. those are Bigfoot encounters that don't fit the narrative of what normal Bigfoot encounters are. Somebody could say that's not a Bigfoot encounter, but at the end of the day, uh, I think that's going to be uh, my best work because these are some frightening, terrifying encounters, man. Like it's just what, the, like imagine riding down the street and looking in your rearview mirror and seeing the Bigfoot face in your in your back seat, but you ain't seeing the rest of the body. You see the head and the shoulders, but you ain't seeing the rest of nobody. It, it, that's just terrifying, man. Yeah. <laughs> if I if I looked in my rearview mirror and saw something like that in my, my back seat, I would probably wreck the car. Mm hmm. Terrifying. And so um, I was talking about outlier encounters earlier. And I, again, that's, I really, really like those encounters um, because they're so far off the beaten path and nobody will talk about them. 
because they're worried about being ridiculed about bringing them forward because people say, oh, that can't be true. I, I mean, I've experienced so much ridicule since I've been on YouTube. I don't care. You know, my channel was birthed out of people just going crazy and talking crazy and doing stuff. So I'm the perfect person to do it because I frankly do not care. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I, uh, I think that that's a, that's a key element too, because if, if you're concerned at all about what could happen, you probably shouldn't be putting books like that out at all. Mm -hmm. You're really opening yourself up for a lot of stuff. Yeah. Well, like that, t <clears throat> that woman on TikTok videos, but she's like, I don't care. Thank you after me. I don't care. And I'm like, I don't think you really understand what you're saying, lady. <laughs> no, she has no clue. She has no clue to many ways that your life can be made hell. I mean, she has no clue. I, I, I'll tell you like this. I've had eyewitnesses to where their bank accounts were drained. But the way their bank accounts were drained was, let's say you got $10,000 in your account, right? Your mortgage is paid for the next 12 months. But you didn't pay your mortgage. But your mortgage is paid. Out of your account, your mortgage is paid. But you ain't got no cash money. You can't buy no groceries. You can't pay for no gas. You can't pay no car note. But your mortgage paid. How in the hell that happened? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And it, like people have no clue what they're dealing with. Absolutely no clue. Absolutely no freaking clue what they're dealing with. So what do you think is the 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 most dangerous aspect of, of releasing things like that do you think it's the government getting interested do you think it's attracting like a dark entity what do you think is the most dangerous aspect of of that of of literature in this field i think it depends on what you're discussing and i think it's uh it really depends on what you're getting into so for example when you get into the demonic elements of things and you really focus on um, talking about demonic things and you're inviting those things in, um, you shine a light in the spirit realm where they know you're talking about them. And so they come to see because technically you're buttoning their business. Like that's their business. You're talking about this particular entity. It's like, oh, who's talking about me? So it comes to see. Um, to me, the biggest threat is the NGOs that are active in this field that nobody talks about. Um, people's they're really non-governmental agencies that have funding black budget funding to deal with certain things those are the biggest threats because there's very little accountability when dealing with them I, my first encounter with them was when i started digging into the stuff that was going on in mexico and around the border um it's not really hard to get stories from those areas because if you market to those areas in spanish and you offer to pay money for people to tell you their stories, you're going to have stories come flooding in. Mm -hmm. um, but then I started getting things coming in. I started getting warnings coming in along with the stories. Like, you know, you really shouldn't be talking about this. This is an area that you should stay away from, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, hey, what is this? What's going on? And they made one mistake and called from a number. And I gave it to a friend of mine here that's an FBI. I said, hey, man, just look at this number and see what's up. And his response was, Jay, I'm going to tell you like this. He said, there's some things that you need to leave alone. And he said, this is one of those things you need to leave alone. This is not a government, but it's a non-governmental agency. And there's nothing, there's no accountability for them. Leave it alone. And I said, thank you, sir. And I left it alone. And you can, it's, it's hinged in time when that happened, because I started talking about the werewolf's encounters in Mexico and in that area. And then I had a story come out about somebody who went to a, a old uh, ruin down there and they were an explorer and they found something and I, I recorded half of the story and I was gonna go back to record the other part and that whole thing was wiped off the computer and I said, I tell you what, we're good, we're not talking about that. We're gonna leave that one alone. And so <clears throat> when you start talking about the the, the forces involved, people say, oh, it's the NSA, the CIA, it's this, it's not. Nah, There's a lot more to it than just um, your standard government agencies. You, you don't have standard government agencies hunting cryptids. You have companies that have black budgets that hunt cryptids and do things of that nature. 
And so anytime you're dealing with black budget money, you got black budget black budget problems. <laughs> I don't need you none think of that. Those might ex- explain some of the quote unquote men in black. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Explain a lot of it. It explained the twenty four hour security you ran into too. Yeah. Explain a lot of different things. Um I've always said like in the field, right? You'll see I I'll tell you how you can see them at work. So go look at any paranormal short that pertains to Bigfoot that has five million or more views. It really starts at a million views. Because I want to say I had one that did 70, 35 million views. And that's when I first noticed it. You start to see the same narrative over and over again. You've seen it. Um, it it'll be, uh, what did you take this video with? A potato? That's one of them. Um, the other one would be uh, another blurry photo. Uh, that's another phrase that's being used. And it is it, the, the problem is there's no creativity in the discrediting. I even said it publicly. I was like, man, if y'all, if y'all gonna take all this money to do things to discredit, you should at least have some credibility. I mean, some creativity in the process of doing it. Like, at least consult with me and give me a million dollars and let me talk with you or something because y'all tripped out. Because I was seeing it and it was just overwhelming. I'm like, how do you have 1,000 comments that say the same thing? It's like, this don't make no damn sense. Like it right. just does across. It just doesn't make any sense, um, and so that's that's the threat. I mean, the level one is just discrediting things and creating narratives and shifting the the narrative. And they know that people will, if I say that, you know, what did you film this with a potato? Then they know how human nature works, and they'll other humans will say it, right? And so they put the narrative out there, and you'll notice it, and they just know how human psychology works and and that's the that's the larger threat just like they know how human psychology works to stir people up to act crazy um Mm -hmm. and do and say crazy things and so there's fingerprints all over the place if you know what you're looking for and in in many cases this field is like a landmine a field of landmines that you're walking through and most people don't understand that you're walking on those mines like boom you're just blowing yourself up but if you understand what you're looking at, you can say, okay, I've seen that mine before. I'm going to go walk this way. That mine right there is very dangerous. So I'm going to put red flags around this. I'm never walking in that area. And these over here, you know, I might blow a pinky toe off. I walk across a couple of these. But this one over here, I'm going to turn into a red mist, and I'm going to stay away from those. And it's just a level of understanding you come to when you really analyze what's going on. And that's, And I can say that confidently. I'll say that I don't think there's anybody in this field that's analyzed the scope of the field the way I have. I just don't always talk about it because there's, I mean, there's only so much you can say. But when you really look at it from a 100,000 foot view looking down, it's like it lights up. You see, um, I mean, you, you just see it. I mean, it's hard to explain. You just see it. It's just, it's just obvious. It's super duper obvious. That's why I say, pay me. A mill, and I'll tell y'all what you need to do, and tell you how you can get the truth out there, and everybody can be happy. Pay me a million, two million. Let's make a let's make a deal. Get some truth out there. Protect everybody. You know what I'm saying? Pay me the bread. <laughs> show me the money, Jerry. Show me the money, guys, and we we can can get truth out there, but not go too crazy. You know what I'm saying? There's always gonna be a hundred percent truthers, and that's dumb. But <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But Ain't nothing wrong with 80, 85. It's the other percent that it's the real dangers in the other percent. But the people have the 85 without, you know, the rest of the foolishness. Right. I think the real danger that, that uh, people in this field run into is when they start calling people out. I think when you start trying to call out certain agencies or certain individuals, you try you attract the attention you don't want. Yeah, I mean, especially when you start um, focusing on the agencies, mm-hmm. like you got to be an idiot. I mean, you really got to be an idiot. Like <sighs> the technology to this day is so far advanced. Oh, 
we lost him for a second. Okay, I'm back. See what I'm there saying? Yeah. Um. Yep. What the heck? You you want to start talking about them people, dog? You tripping? <laughs> Hey, listen, peeps. I'm not about to say nothing crazy. Relax. All I'm gonna say is this: the technology is so Too far back. advanced that um, that you have to be mindful of. There is no privacy, right? And that's what people need to be mindful of. So, if my advice to somebody who's a creator, a content creator, and I appreciate you guys leaving the stream alone because I ain't going left like you thought I was. My advice to any content creator is this: you know, find your space, find your lane and stick to it and make it entertainment and it'll be profitable for you and your family it really will be um let's see almost done i i want to want to say for the record we have no intention of singling out or going after any agencies <laughs> or pointing fingers nope. nor do i plan on disappearing anytime <laughs> soon i just want to write my books and do my do my little investigation and talk about these these things and and you know maybe we can we can share an idea or two, but as for exposing anything, not what I'm out for. Disclaimer: This is for entertainment purposes only. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that that's bro. Think about it, bro. If anybody who's been listening for a long time, there was a time period when I didn't have a disclaimer. Then I. My dog man molested by Bigfoot, chased by chupacabras. Uh, arrested or detained by the CIA, CIA, NSA, uh, BLM, or anybody else, right? Because at the end of the day, there is um, powerful interest at play. I, yeah, and I don't exactly. understand I don't understand the interest itself. I, I really think when don't. we do our next intro, we're going to we're going to put in the disclaimer. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't understand. I, I don't I don't I'm, Maybe I'm not smart enough to completely understand it. Frankly, I don't care to understand it. You know, I just don't. Um, it's just the technology is far more advanced than people will understand. And so just know that there's no privacy. We're in an environment now that um, there's drone flies, like a fly, yeah. that's a drone. <laughs> so you have no privacy. You know what I'm saying? And that's what we, that's been disclosed. Uh, on the internet so if there's a drone fly there's a drone gnat so man it ain't no winning that battle <laughs> you know what i'm saying well, ain't no I, winning I that battle the late 80s from from when my time in the military uh, i know from the late 80s it was possible for the spy satellites of the 80s to read a newspaper somebody was holding in their hands from orbit now that was in 1988 89 so what can they do now? Bro, it's crazy. In 90, 1994, 96, 90, 97, I was working for the Department of Space, U.S. Department of Space and Strategic Defense Command in Huntsville, Alabama on Redstone Arsenal. And the satellites that um, we were concerned about were so powerful that and the only way to, to hide what we were doing was to get tarps that looked like foliage and spread the tarp that looked like foliage over an area that damn near was the size of a freaking football field. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I mean, that was the only way. I mean, and that's how powerful the satellites were. And even mm -hmm. then, you would go into a meeting in the underground bunker and they'd be like, ah, um, you guys didn't get it rolled out quick enough. I'm like, what you mean? Not that, what are you talking about? And that, that's when I realized how powerful not only our government was, but other governments were at that point in time. So, man, for the record, to those listening, I acknowledge the fact that you're listening. We thank you for your contribution and we thank you for your service. And don't get it <laughs> twisted. Nobody don't want no smoke with y'all. Just kick back, relax, enjoy the show, baby. Enjoy the show. Because that's all it is, is a show. Exactly. <laughs> All right, guys, I'm going to hop off of here and get ready to get in a bed because I got to get up early and get some things rolling, man. I want you to guys know I really appreciate it. Anytime you want to want me back, man, I enjoyed the show. And I enjoyed well, hanging out. We loved having you. And I, yeah. I, I think we could probably do another three-hour show and still not have scratched the surface. Oh, no, bro. I probably could run for six hours um, just, just going and keep on going. Uh, there's a lot. 
that I would love to talk about. But it, you know, when, when people start kicking out the stream, it's time for you to go and sit your behind down somewhere and relax. You know what I'm saying? True. So you know, maybe sometime <laughs> after the holidays when things settle down, I'd love to get you back on. Sounds good, brother. Sounds good. To the audience, thank you guys for joining us. Um, I do want to promote something. We're we're we started what's called the Men of Steel Prayer Group, man. Uh, DA Robbie, we're gonna invite you guys to it, the influencer section of it. But for if you're an audience and you're a male and you've been having problems with your family or finances or anything like that, go to strongmenpraying.com. It's called the Men of Steel Prayer Group. It'll be Bible studies on Wednesday, and it's going to address things that people in this field are not aware of that are affecting their lives. And I promise you, it's going to be hardcore, but it's going to teach you a lot. And it's going to teach you things you need to know to actually fulfill the purpose as to why you are here listening to this. Um, and it'll be all laid out to you. So Men of Steel prayer group is called strongmenpraying.com. All right, guys. Um, man, I really appreciate you having me on, buddy. Thank you so much for coming. We, we've had a blast. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. All right. Anytime you guys want me back, we'll hang out again. We'll run it for three hours. Sounds good to me. Sounds great. You have a good night, All sir. Right. Thank you for All being right. here. Good night. That was freaking awesome. Yeah. I loved having him on. That was a really good show. I agree. Well, we probably should uh, discuss discuss our affiliates and uh, and then start wrapping things up because yep. I know you got to get up early, don't you? Yeah, I got court in the morning. All right. Well, I'm going to play uh, the video message from old Doc himself and uh, the fine uh, word from our fine sponsor over at Dark Angel Medical. Hey, everybody. This is Kerry Pocket Doc Davis from Dark Angel Medical, and you are listening to DAX Machina with DA Roberts. You may recognize me or some of my products from Dark Angel Medical in some of the Apex Predator, Lakeview Man, and Wild Hunt books. And you can get those products at www.darkangelmedical.com along with training classes on how to use those products and save a life. Shoot us an email at info at darkangelmedical.com and be the difference. And folks... You know, if you go over to darkangelmedical.com, don't forget to use discount code CRYPTID25 for 25% off your entire order. Those those kits are birthdays in, in, in packages. They, you know, if these uncertain times, and it doesn't matter what you're doing, even if you're just commuting to work, you never know when a, when a, a medical kit's going to come in handy. Uh, I keep it. I keep one in my vehicle. I keep one close to me. And anytime we go in the field, we've got at least one on us. Uh, these medical kits can and will save your life. Get 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 a get a little bit of training. Know how to use a tourniquet because the life you save could very well be your own. So darkangelmedical.com. It's H HSA and FSA eligible, uh, and you can also get training classes on how to use these kits. Uh, yep. So definitely there were some into that. There were some people in the chat asking tonight. Yes, uh, go. Doc has a Dark Angel medical class or medical uh, on YouTube, and he has some free classes on there. Um, so if you put in Dark Definitely. Angel medical on YouTube, you can act, you can actually get into some of the free training that he offers on that. So for those of you who are asking, just put in Dark Angel medical in the search on YouTube, and you'll find it. Robbie, you want to tell us a little bit about the Scallywag Tactical? And show off your new toy. <laughs> Scallywag Tactical, and I finally got one. It took me for, forever, but uh, this is the Gunner's Mate. That's the, also the Gunner's Mate over there, that way. Not this way, but that way. But with? With, uh, I believe that's the Wild Hunt symbol on that side, and flip it around, and there's the Dark Frontier symbol on the other side. Thank you, Karen. DA knows a guy that has a laser engraving, laser engraving business that does laser engraving stuff on all kinds of things. Definitely. But Scott, back to the, the actual affiliate. Uh, you've, if you've read the books, you, I know you've heard of the gunner's mate. You've heard of the Jolly Roger. Uh, You've heard of the privateer, uh, the bounty, the boarding axe. I, there, there's a reason that all that all those names are in the books. 
They're in the books because they're really good quality knives. And <clears throat> I could not wait to get my hands on this knife. And it is everything that I thought it was going to be. This is just an amazing knife. I, mean, I told DA, I said, I've had this thing in my hand every night since I came home from Missouri. It, this, it, this is just a knife that you, it makes you want to hold it. For whatever reason, it just it feels it good feels, in your hand. Yes, it does. It feels so good in the hand. And <clears throat> if you ask USDA, most of the time when we were out walking around, I had this out more than I had my gun out. Yeah. And it's heavy enough, you know, if you really needed to, you could lop a tree branch off with that thing. Oh, yeah. Or an arm. <laughs> <laughs> you might be onto something there, or deer head. <laughs> Just saying, it would have been a lot cleaner than what we saw, yes. but it would be possible. Anyway, go over to Scallywag Tactical, check out their blades, their kitchen knives, their skinning knives. They've got a Bowie knife. I believe it's called the Bad Bo Bad Bowie. Uh, DA's got one of those too. He could probably whip out oh, and show you. And the, I, yeah. I think, yeah. And that's a pretty cool little knife too. I've had, I have my hands on one of those, and those little uh, teeth on the back of it—they're pretty nasty. Sure. They'll mess, they'll mess you up if you ain't careful. They um, are sharp. Sure. So head on over to Scallywag Tactical, check them out. They've got, they've got any, every kind of knife that you're gonna want. Check out the blemish blade section. A lot of times it's just the box that's messed up. Uh, I don't know if it's still on there. I don't know how many, but they had this gunner's mate was on there for $85. And this is normally like a $300 knife. So mm -hmm. if it's still on there, you can get this knife for $300 or for $85 versus $300. Gary, um, thank you for the super chat. Thanks, Gary. Also, uh, when you're, when you go through and, uh, Julie, you, he'll, he'll, he'll really like it. I mean, if he likes knives, and this is the knife he wants, then might want to try to get it because if he's a knife person, which I am, I've had every kind of knife you could imagine. Shrade, uh, Spyderco, Kershaw, Gerber, you name it, I've had it. And these... I mean, Scalawag blades are better quality than I think any oh, yeah. knife I've ever owned. They're just damn good knives. Robbie, do we lose you? I can't hear you now. Can you hear me? Well, you went quiet. I thought it was me for a second. Well, Robbie will be right back, folks. Give him just a second. Now my micro, my camera. Man, we're having some weird technical glitches. Huh. How bizarre. Let me see if I can get my camera to refocus. Hold on a second. It's supposed to auto-focus, but it's not focusing. There you go, Robbie. My back. Yeah, yep, I got you. I got to adjust the focus on my camera, so... Yeah, my audio goes out and your focus goes out. Hmm. Weird, I know. Anyway, what I was saying, um, I actually don't remember where I was specifically at, but anyway, go over, check them out, check out the Blemish Blade section. Uh, use uh, code DA Roberts 10 at checkout and you'll get an extra 10% off your, uh, your purchase. Check them out. You won't be disappointed. They make some of the best knives that you could that you could possibly ask for. I now have one, two, three, four, five. And they're the best knives that I own. So we'll cut your microphone too if you ain't careful. <laughs> Lopper in half. I'm not used to how long this one is. 
And our uh, our other uh, affiliate is Ken Brock over at BrockBlades.com. I didn't see Ken tonight. I didn't I see him in the, in the chat busting your chops. Uh, I have to send him a message, make sure he's all right. Um, but uh, Ken's a career law enforcement. He's retired now, makes knives in his backyard. He makes them custom made. Uh, they're all made by hand. Like this one's called the Skane Do, which is modeled off of an old old Scottish knife. It means black blade. Um, Skane Do is kind of a utility knife. I keep, I carry mine all the time. Um, but he, he, all of his blades are handmade, whereas the Scallywag blades are top quality. They're all mass produced. So the two gunners mate side by side, other than the coloration of the blade and Rob, of Robbie's and mine, they're, they're identical. Uh, but but Ken's can... blades are all unique. They're all custom made. You can choose the color. You can choose the, the, the shape of the blade. Uh, there's a lot yeah. of things that you can factor. Hold, hold yours up again, DA, because this is a skein do also. Ain't, you can see the differences in, in the, the blade, the handle. Like I said, or like DA was saying, these they're both the exact same type of knife, but it's just but very different from each other. Variations. Uh, you can order a custom blade and choose the design, choose the colors, choose the type of handle you want, and it's all it's all custom made. And if you've got an outdoorsman in your life, uh, people that hunt, fish, backpack, cryptid hunting, if somebody uh, enjoys knives, the gift of a custom blade is something that they would truly cherish. Uh, because these are high quality, made to, made to be used. They're not meant to be, you know, set on a shelf and looked at. These are high quality, high carbon steel, very good quality blades. Uh, and Ken Ken is a top notch dude, and he makes makes an excellent product. Uh, so check out definitely check out BrockBlades.com. You can order anything existing on the on the website and use discount code Cryptid10. Or if you order custom or in a custom order in the description, make sure you mention that you heard about BrockBlades.com here on the show, and uh, he'll you'll still he'll still make sure you get your ten percent off your entire one. Uh, nineteen eighty C and H. He's talking about the Ardennes. Isn't that one that you got a special order now? He don't have. Yes, you have to special order the Ardennes. He does not yeah. keep those in stock. He says yeah, that's, that's why you're just not a tremendous amount of work. Yeah, that's why you're not going to see a picture of it because it's not something that he keeps in stock. He that is. He's, he he's making makes, one for he's making one for me. I just don't have it yet. Yep, I've seen I've seen the blank, and uh, actually, <laughs> I'm going sometime probably after christmas i'm going to start on mine but because i know how to make knives i'm he's not making <laughs> he's making me make mine so he's gonna stand by and watch while i mess it up and then laugh at me again which he's very good at doing i think i let me see if i can find that picture i had of the ardennes uh give me a second I know I had it once upon a time. Give me just a second. May not have it. Yeah, it's been a minute since you showed that picture. It may be. Here we go. This is not the one I originally had, but uh, it still give you a good idea of what the basic Ardennes looks like. That's a that's the basic Ardennes. Of course, you know if you custom order one, you can pick the type of handle and the material it's made out of, and and all all of that stuff. But uh, yeah, that's that's the basic concept of the Ardennes. It's ba it's a a Bowie knife style. It's a it's a large blade, a uh, large drop point blade. Definitely a heavy duty knife for 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 uh, everyday use and for you know everything from skinning out a buck to setting up your camp it's a utility knife yeah. and meant to be used it's on point or on par with the gunner's mate uh, or yeah i would say it's very probably. similar similar design i think the ardennes is a little bit thicker it heavier, is thicker. thicker belly on the blade than uh than the gunner's mate but the gunner's mate is probably heavier because the tang on the gunner's mate's a lot thicker than a tang on the uh, Ardennes. So the gunner's mate overall is probably going to be a heavier knife, which lends more to a to chopping and, as Dio said earlier, lopping off things. Whereas the uh, Ardennes would be more of a skinner or a combat style. Which, make no mistake, you could use either one of them for either either or though. But 
Uh, hey, Bauer, it's like BA. What's the code for Scallywag? I just posted it again. It should be popping up any second. It's DA Roberts 10. There it is. Yep. DA Roberts 10 at, at your checkout. That'll get you 10% off your entire order. It even applies on the on the blemished blades. Mm -hmm. So you can get an extra 10% off of a, like, if this you is $85, you, get, you still get an extra 10% off of that. Julie says my Julie Whipple says my fiance has a lot of scallywag blades. They make awesome blades. I've got I've got a bunch of them. The one I didn't get to get was that tomahawk they had out. Oh, by the time I had the money, after you know, I've got a few bills paid off, I went to get it. Gone. It's not on the website. I'm gonna have to reach out to Craig and see if I can I can get see if he might actually have be you know, get, be getting them back, or if he might actually accidentally have one on hand. But mm -hmm. I need to reach out to Craig because I really want one. Um, we were approaching the end of the show. Yeah, you know, and I, one thing I always want to talk about is the 22 a day foundation. And I don't know, you guys have probably seen this on my on my uh on my wrist. I wear it all the time. The 22 a day foundation is uh it's something that's very near and dear to me. We lose 22 veterans a day to suicide. And if you look at the officer down memorial page, uh, we're losing just as many first responders. Uh, and not all not all of the first responders line of duty deaths are are because of incidents in line of duty. There are first responders we're losing to suicide. And that is a horrible, horrible thing uh, because we owe these men and women in uniform a debt that we'll never be able to fully repay. Uh, I've, I've seen I've heard too many last calls on the radio. I've, I've seen too many folded flags handed out. And I and I, I hate I hate it that I've seen each one, each each one that I've seen. Uh, because it's 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 a deep loss to 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 see that folded flag and hear hear taps played at the funeral, and it's it's something that has affected me profoundly. Um, have seen too many friends buried under that flag, um, but we you know we 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 need to do better. We need to reach out to these folks and let them know we're thinking about them, because uh, you never know. It might be the, the last person you would expect. Uh, that you someone that's laughing and joking all the time might be going through some of the worst things that you can imagine. So reach out to your friends and family, reach out to the people that you care about and let them know that you're thinking about them. I mean, you know, Robbie and doc reach out to me. I reach out to them. You know, whenever we know one of each, one of each other is going through a hard patch, we're, we're, we're there for each other. Same with Steve. Um, and you know, if y'all don't have anybody else to reach out, reach out to me, my contact information's in there. Shoot me an email. I'm happy to talk. Uh, but we've 22 a day is 22 too many. And that, that applies to really to everybody, not just, you know, veterans, but, you know, just be there for the people you care about. Let them know you're there. Let them know you're thinking about them. And that, that hey, how are you doing text might be the thing that keeps them off the edge that day. Uh, so, you know, definitely, definitely reach out. Uh, let them know. And uh, yeah, the, the Till Valhalla project is now is an excellent place to, you can get awesome t-shirts from Till Valhalla. Uh, tumblers, mugs, and stuff like that, and just fantastic stuff. And the, and the proceeds go to help veterans, uh, to help them get therapy, help them get service animals, and things like that. And it's a it's a great charity, and it's something that I I definitely am proud to support. Um, yeah, Julie Whipple, please use those VA resources. Um, one thing that people don't understand, uh, unless you've been there, is people that have been on the sharp end of the stick people who who've who've been out there in the ugly it's it's sometimes it's hard for them to reach out and it's even harder for them to talk to somebody that hasn't been there because it's hard to explain what that feeling is like in those critical situations it's it's almost impossible to explain it to somebody who hasn't lived it um, so you know those of us that have that have been there we 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 should we should definitely be there for our brothers brothers and sisters um uh, let them know you're there let them know you're available and, and if there are resources you, you know reach out to those resources make use of those resources because we you know, we don't want to lose any more of our brothers and sisters um we again like i said we owe a debt to the men and women in uniform that we can never repay and that's veterans active duty you know reserves national guard law enforcement First responders of all kinds, firefighters, you know, EMTs, 
corrections officers, security, anybody that's put their ass on the line for all of us, we owe them a debt. And we, we need to be there for them to help them pick up the pieces because sometimes they see things that they just can't ever forget. And um, that's, that's the really tragic part is is that they think they're alone because nobody can understand what they've been through. Um, we've all been there to a degree, folks. And, um, you know, just be kind to your brothers and sisters and let them know that you're there for them. Um, and again, if you don't have somebody else to reach out, shoot me an email, shoot me a message on Facebook. I'd rather, I'd rather, you know, talk with you than, than hear, hear something tragic. So, um, I'm gonna gonna close out the show with a toast, and it's something that uh, we started doing, and something I want to continue doing. There's an old Irish drinking song called "The Parting Glass," and at Irish pubs all over the world, it's generally the last song of the night. But when you literally listen to the lyrics, it's talking about more than just than just saying goodnight to the other bar patrons. It's about saying goodbye and lifting a glass to those who can't lift that glass again anymore. And we're going to raise our glasses to the ones we've lost, those men and women in uniform, and, and, and also in tribute to those that we still have and hope to for a long time to come. Uh, so we're going to close it out with a toast. And uh, if you guys haven't heard the song, The Parting Glass, I would hope you go on YouTube and search it and listen to the song because it's a beautiful tune. Uh, so we're going to close her out with this. But since it fell unto my lot that I should rise and you should not, I'll gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be to you all. Good night, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Catch us again Wednesdays and Saturdays on DAX Machina. A special thanks to all our channel members and Patreon supporters. Please make sure to like, share, and subscribe.